One of the green mountain care board. Um, our executive director is currently testifying over in the legislature, so um, I will give the executive director's report on her behalf. And um, the first thing that um, Susan had asked me to acknowledge and give a shout out to the hard work of a lot of people in state government. Uh, and that is that uh, the final evaluation for the level one um, state innovation grants came back and there were nine uh, grants that were analyzed from six different states and really the only one that showed really positive results was Vermont. And so there are a lot of people in Vermont who did an awful lot of hard work that um, are owed our gratitude. And they were able to build off early successes and things like the Blueprint for Health. But I know that Pat Jones is in the room today. She did a lot of work. Craig Jones, Georgia Meharis, Robin Lunge, uh, Justin Visible, uh, Kate O'Neill. It just goes on and on and on, and um, I just want to say that I think that this evaluation, um, which was brought up um, at our recent meeting in Washington, D.C., is going to add rocket fuel to the support that um, we're going to have for people as we move forward with the uh, all-payer model. And I don't know, maybe Robin you might want to say a few words? Yes, I just want to echo your thanks, um, and particularly I want to thank George Maharis, who is the staff lead on the SIM project, um, and really did heroic work in terms of managing the federal relationship and the, all the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of the contracting, which was a lot. Um, and as a former member of the SIM core team, I think we couldn't have had such a good result without the deep engagement uh, by all sectors, by the provider community, by uh, the payer community, as well as, as you said, many, many, many state employees, including Amy Kunrat, who's in the audience. I'll give her a shout out, too. So uh, I, I'm so pleased at, at the result, and uh, I'm thankful that we were able to get the grant and that we were able to use it wisely. I guess I would just add to it, having come into the board probably midway through this, I can only see it from the folks at the board level that were heavily engaged, but I know Alva Bay and Ina Backus and Richard Slotsky really were very engaged in stakeholder meetings. And I just look back and think all the work, the hard work that went into this, and I think about the quality measures alignment, Pat Jones, and there's a big shout out in the report about getting that right, and I know you did a lot of work on that. Um, so anyway, I just, I'm, I'm grateful for all the people that came before us, and this is exciting, exciting news, and a validation of all that hard work, and I think it's, a validation of the all payer model in many ways, and excited to be a part of it. Super. So, just a uh, uh, couple of updates. Um, of course, uh, we, in addition to this morning's meeting, we have uh, two enforcement hearings this afternoon with Mount Scutney and North Country. We are uh, back here again on Friday, and um, the last enforcement hearing will be next Wednesday morning with Springfield, and we'll also have uh, a hearing next Wednesday morning with Springfield on their request to have a increase to their charge. And we do have uh, public comment is open, um, so anyone can go to our website and um, express their public comment at this time. So. Um, with that, I am going to move to the minutes of Monday, April 8th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Monday, April 8th, without any corrections, deletions, or additions. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So with that, we're going to uh, move to the all-payer model implementation and ACO regulation update. So come on down, people. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. I am joined today by several members of both our ACO.
OPR regulation and all pair model implementation teams, Marissa Malma, Michelle Debris, and Sarah Lindbergh, to provide an update on the first quarter of 2019 and to give you a preview of several activities to come in 2019. the agenda that we plan to cover today. Um, Marissa will provide an update on our 2019 ACO budget monitoring and timeline, review the reports that um, are in the budget order from 2019, and she'll also give you a preview into planning for 2020 ACO budget review and certification. Um, then Michelle, myself, and Sarah will all speak on different components of the ACO model agreement, the Healthcare model, ACO model agreement, including um, an upcoming evaluation, reporting, and some updates on where we are in terms of our goals with quality and health, scale, and financial performance. And then finally, at the end, we will have an interactive demonstration of our total cost of care tool. So this is uh, the logic model that we've been using as a reminder and touchstone for the questions that we're testing through the Alpha model. Um, so, you know, the questions are, if we increase the share of value-based payments in Vermont and put providers at risk for quality and cost, will we be able to accelerate care delivery transformation? Um, we're looking to improve outcomes on the 20 population-based goals that are in the agreement that were identified by the state, and while slowing or maintaining the growth of healthcare in Vermont. So, we have found as we start to go into the second year of the model that we're starting to see results where payment changes are providing flexibility for providers to develop local transformations in care delivery. A um, couple examples would include, um, you heard last month or in February from a provider who said he was able to hire a mental health practitioner to be embedded in his practice. We know that there's increased care coordination being, um, being embedded in the community. Um, we also know that the state and one care identified that they wanted to put more investments into the parent-child centers. So they expanded a project that was running in 2018 to from one site to four new sites in 2019. So um, we're hoping that all of these process changes will get us to the improved outcomes that we would like to see, including access to primary care, fewer deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and a reduced prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. With that, I will turn it over to Marissa. Thanks, Melissa. My name is Marissa Milliman, and I've been working with the uh, team to bring the ACO monitoring and reporting into more a uh, regular and standard uh, cycle. Uh, so the ACO reports to us on a quarterly, semi-annual, and annual deadlines, as well as uh, some additional reporting that's required according to occurrence of certain activities of the ACO. The budget order reporting timeline was written according to calendar year quarters, with reporting for the quarter due 30 days after the end of the quarter. So we have those uh, time frames up on the slide there. Uh, so for quarterly reporting that we uh, receive uh, on a regular basis, that includes financial statements and financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. Um, these include specific ratios that you've asked us to monitor, uh, the administrative expense ratio, population health management, payment reform program investment ratios, as well as reserve requirements. Um, in addition, we've asked the ACO to provide to us updated policies and procedures. These are generally a certification requirement. Um, there's a, a, a long list of policies and procedures they have, certain ones that we review um, regularly for certification requirements, and so we're, we want to get those um, on a regular basis as they're approved by their board. Some um, of these items have to be reported more frequently if they're required. On a semi-annual reporting basis, we've asked for complaint and grievance information by pair, um, as well as performance monitoring, performance to targets. That includes attribution by pair, risk to hospitals, financial performance by pair contracts. And I also wanted to make a note that in preparation for the first receipt of reports, a quarterly reporting on April 30th, 
the staff has been working to develop the reporting timeline and standard manual and templates for the ACO. So this quarter, we've been working with the hospital budget and financial team at the board to develop reporting templates and to upload these into our adaptive software, which is used for hospital budget reporting. Uh, using the adaptive software will help us to streamline the reporting by creating a shared platform between um, the board and the ACO to review these reports. Um, we're going to start specifically with financial templates, but we're planning to move toward more reporting towards adaptive as um, it makes sense and as we're able to. So this slide lists uh, annual reporting and reporting on new programs or one-time reports that were like <coughs> financial and other programs. The ones, and I apologize, the ones with the asterisks are specifically required for all payer model reporting and that they're, and they're also included in the budget. Um, so that includes um, data that we need for the payer differential report, it's an all payer model requirement. Um, both the budget and certification required interim financial reporting on the 2019 comprehensive payment reform pilot and final reporting on the 2018 Comprehensive Payment Reform Pilot. We will also be getting the value-based incentive fund distribution methodology for 2020 and quarter three. Under population health and other programs, we will be receiving uh, most of these in quarter one, it includes the scale target ACO initiatives report, the 2020 network development strategy and timeline, quality improvement and management work plan, and the timeline for 2019 plan to address childhood adversity <clears throat> as uh, these are required these are required for certification there's also reporting for the specialist payment pilot and the community innovation fund so I want to make a note that uh, one care is scheduled to come and present before the board on May 22nd for a program update and update on their contracts and budget numbers finally I want to review with you today the timeline for uh, budget guidance development and ACO certification guidance. So currently, April through May, we're in internal development of ACO budget guidance and uh, the 2020 certification eligibility <coughs> verification form. In June, we are planning to present the guidance to the board for your review, as well as accept and open it up to public comment. Um, we expect to post the guidance in July uh, after a board vote. The ACO will submit their budget uh, in October. This will be open to public comment. Um, we're, again, working to concurrently do certification with review. In October, end of October, early November, the ACO will present their budget to the board. Um, we will present analysis in December close the public comment period and vote um, by the end of September. No, sorry, December. Mm -hmm. um, turn it over for your <coughs> model. One microphone. Okay. Okay, now we're going to switch into the Vermont All Pair ACO model agreement update. Um, I wanted to give you an update on the all-pair model evaluation that is required per Section 17 of the agreement. Um, CMMI shall conduct an evaluation to test the impact of the all-pair model across the five years. Um, they have contracted with NORC, uh, N-O-R-C, at the University of Chicago, who has background and experience in evaluating next generation programs. Um, they are taking Vermont's history of healthcare reform into their design, um, and we've been speaking with them since January. So they've shared with us that they're going to be they're considering Vermont's first Medicaid global commitment waiver, which happened in 2006, and then the start of the blueprint in 2008, the creation of the board in 2011, um, the pursuit of single payer, the shared savings programs in the SIM grant, uh, all of which they are um, you know supposing, presupposing, lay the groundwork for the current all pair model. So our first visit from NORC will be in June of 2019. Um, the documents on the background of their evaluation and the first evaluation report are both on this um, page. 
So I wanted to review what their initial evaluation questions will be. Um, they're looking at the, you know, why, if, how and why the model is successful, including implementation challenges and successes. They're looking for replicability at a state, community, or nation level. Um, they will be looking at the impact on population health and claims-based outcomes. Um, and they have a variety of methods by which to do this. So the model will be evaluated using both state and ACO level comparison groups. Um, when identifying states in the comparison groups, they did share with us that several important char characteristics will be prior history of uh, payment reform and SIM, and also um, participation in the MAPCP. And you know, finally of note, they keep naming three unique characteristics of our model when they're taking this into um, consideration for the evaluation, and those are the state level of flexibility that we have to design the Medicare program, the investments in care management that our state is making, and the regulatory oversight activity and authority that the board has. So turning to the flexibility that we have in designing the Vermont Next Generation Program, um, we do call it the Vermont ACO Medicare Initiative, uh, where we in year two had the flexibility to design the ACO Medicare Initiative of which you approved several items of that um, participation agreement over the summer, including the quality measures. So when we're designing the program, we and CMS look for alignment and attribution in different payment mechanisms, in the risk arrangements that the uh, ACO has with both Medicare and the other payers, and the ACO quality measures. And there was quite a bit of work done over the summer to align all of the ACO quality measures as much as possible with the Medicare program. And all of the payers are also working on that task. So um, in the agreement each year, CMS and Vermont need to agree to the benchmark growth rate, which we did last winter, and how it ties to quality performance the ACO quality measures, and then any additional operational changes of which we're beginning to speak with CMS right now to identify if there are any things that we'd like to add in for performance year three. This slide should look sort of familiar. Uh, unless it's taller than me. <laughs> Uh, so this slide outlines the reports that we're responsible for submitting to CMMI through the duration of the agreement. So on here we've sort of just started with the uh, reports that are due starting with just their initial um, due date and then just noting that a lot of these are quarterly or annual. Um, and I just wanted to note, so I did a quick count this morning, so from now moving forward, there are roughly 37 additional reports that we will be submitting to CMMI between now and 2023, which we'll be reporting on the final year of the agreement. So it's a lot. That would be too much on one slide. <laughs> um, so for example, total cost of care reporting has begun. You're going to hear from Sarah. You're going to see a super cool data visualization from the analytics team, um, and that will continue quarterly through the duration of the agreement. Um, we've got our first um, payer differential report will be coming out this month. Uh, our first scale target report is due in June, and our first uh, health outcomes and quality of care report will be uh, coming out in September. So you'll probably be seeing a lot of us this summer. Uh, and I do have, all of these um, reports are outlined quite well in the agreement, but if you have questions on what any of them mean, I'm happy to walk you through that. This slide should look really familiar and jog your memory. It's Pat Jones Archives right here, and shout out to Pat in the audience. Uh, so this is just a quick reminder of the quality framework. Um, the three domains listed in the infographic here have associated targets that we'll be measuring through that annual reporting. Um, the um, I wanted to just kind of regroup and remind everyone that this is a cumulative improvement approach. And so we're going to um, sort of recognize that quality improvement interventions take time. So each measure has a target. There are 20 of them. Sometimes you'll hear us say there are 21. There is an additional measure in the agreement to be specified. We're working on that with our analytics vendor. Uh, but it will be reporting only through the duration of the agreement. There's no uh, performance tied to that. So um, just reminding folks that looking at these domains here, um, we have to achieve five of seven of the pro 
process milestones, four of seven of the healthcare delivery system quality targets, and four of six of the health outcomes quality targets to be considered um, by the end of the agreement. And, um, this is pretty boring, but just to say that we're still collecting data for 2018, uh, and we won't have it all, and that's why the report is due in September. So we're starting to get some of it in, starting to analyze that, um, and looking forward to being able to present the report to you um, in the fall of this year for the 2018 performance year. Um, and that's about some of the reporting that we're going to do to date. So there's quite a lag on the results. So it's about nine months lag. So we just recently submitted our quarter two report for the 2018 performance year um, for, for our financial targets. Our scale targets actually won't be reported on until June of this year for last year. So none of the information I have for you today is exactly final. Uh, there are some challenges in any measurement. Um, the main challenge with our scale target is that we know we don't have an exact picture of the number of self-funded lives that are out there that aren't submitting to our claims database. I always think of it as a known unknown, so uh, estimates may change between now and the final reporting. But at a high level, uh, we believe that, uh, well, on the top you can see the scale target in our performance, uh, there's one for Medicare. So last year it was 60% and we, think we came in around 35%. And in performance year 19, the target for Medicare is 75% and we think we came in about 51%. Again, this is uh, subject to change, but um, that's a similar magnitude of growth between the first two years, but we're about a year behind in terms of the target. Uh, so we're, you know, working hard on trying to figure out the best uh, strategy for trying to address that. So the all-payer target, again, this is going to be um, include self-funded groups not reporting the VCARES. It includes uh, commercial plans, uh, including Medicare Advantage, which is considered commercial for the purposes of this market, uh, for this reporting uh, framework. And that target last year was 36%. We think we came in about 20 uh, and the performance target for this year is half the population. That's, that's ambitious, and we think we're going to be between 30 and 40. Uh, the range there has to do with some um, potential programs that may or may not come to fruition within the current performance year. Uh, so looking ahead through the course of the model, so the magnitude of increase from 19 to 18 is a little less ambitious, so we're looking at for 20, 79% of the Medicare population uh, and 58% of the all payer. So we, again, we just submitted our um, second quarterly report for our financial targets. Uh, these targets are designed to be a, a per person growth, and there's two different buckets that they come in. One is just for Medicare, the Medicare total cost of care, and the second one is the all payer total cost of care. Now, in the final two years of the agreement, the Medicare total cost of care will be a subset of the all-payer target, but in these first few years, the Medicare total cost of care is exactly aligned to the ACO population, so that they're not one-to-one, -one. and we can get into some more details about that, but it can be really confusing pretty fast, so. Um, yeah, uh, hang on, uh, just want to remind people about how it's calculated, so. Um, we are on the hook for basically most of the folks with claims and VCARES for this, so we're not on the hook for those self-funded people for whom we don't have claims. We're not on the hook for the federal employees at this point or military groups. It's people who have claims and VCARES. And the way we, we calculate it is um, we, for each person in VCARES for the month, we try and figure out what we think their primary payer is. So for instance, if I have both Medicare and Medicaid, I'm gonna consider you to be a Medicare person for the all-payer model purposes because that's who's generally paying first. 
always exceptions to these rules, but uh, you know, there are some services that maybe Medicare doesn't cover where Medicaid would pay first, but we're just calling them a Medicare person. And then we look for any spending in our claims database <coughs> for that month in that payer type. So that means that if the spending happened in state, out of state, it doesn't matter, we're on the hook for all that spending. In addition to the claim stuff that we're seeing, we are also adding a component that doesn't run through claims. So the primary care medical home and community health team and SASH payments, they're not flowing through VCARES. Shared savings is another example of something that we're including as spending that doesn't flow through claims. So what we do is we try to find a per person per month add-on to the claims-based spending to try and get a comprehensive picture of the spend. We are not including retail pharmacy spending, and there's a good portion of Medicaid spending that's not a covered service in the agreement between ACO and Medicaid, and per the agreement, those services are not included. The upshot is it's about half of Medicaid spending that is in the total cost of care. The sum of sum of care, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, so in these first years of the agreement, the Medicare total cost of care is just that ACO population. And to try and be fair to the ACO, what we're going to do is compare the actual spending in 2018 to a hypothetical population in 2017. So what happens is our federal partners <coughs> run a pretend performance year. So who would have been attributed to one care in 2017 based on the 2018 provider list? And how did all that spending shake out? And we're gonna compare the actuals in 18 to that hypothetical 17 population. So I think that's probably the best way to do it um, because when you're prospectively aligned, you're inevitably gonna lose people along the way. And one particularly material way that you lose people is due to death. They're very expensive. And so we wanna make sure that those costs are in the base so that it's as one-to-one -one as possible. Uh, however, that means that um, the numerator, the spending in 18, is not going to be our denominator for 19. We're gonna have a different hypothetical population run in 2018 based on the 2019 provider list. So there'll be a lot of overlap, but these nuances can be pretty material, which is why you know I'll probably repeat it a million times. <laughs> but for uh, performance year 18, and then here's another confusing thing. Uh, the Medicare target is 3.5%, not anything to do with the all-pair model per se, but because the board chose to use the floor. <coughs> so the target was 3.7%, and we need to be 0.2 below that, which is the 3.5%. So all-payer and Medicare happen to be the same for performance year 2018, but that's not going to be true for the most part. And so here it is. Uh, so. Our Medicare data are not final. Uh, we've had, uh, we're still mapping some fields into VCures that we're going to need to be able to run this in the all payer claims database. And we also are lacking some baseline information from our federal partners. So, in its stead, we are using some standard uh, reports associated with the Next Generation program with Medicare. Uh, we feel good about the data here. The, the ACO has reported that they're able to tie out to this pretty well, so I think they have comfort with this data source. Um, however, the final numbers are likely to change, but I believe that the magnitude and direction of the growth are gonna be substantially similar uh, the, within a few percentage points, uh, tenths of a percentage points. Um, but as so far through Q2, so this would be claims incurred, so a service date um, within from January to June of 2018, with paid run out through the end of the year. So we have time for those claims to accumulate. So in uh, 2017, that estimate was about $818 per person per month, um, cumulatively through the first two quarters, and it's uh, about $834 so far in 2018. So that shows a 1.9% growth rate today. Uh, keep in mind that because you set the target for the, the ACO, you know, spoiler alert, this is going to come in at 3.5 at the end of the year. <laughs> so, um, you know, it looks great and it you know, shows that the, the ACO is being pretty efficient in their care delivery, but, um, you know, we kind of already know the answer to this uh, particular measure. And here's showing the trend. So, uh, you can see that it's a uh, you know, sometimes it's gone up by as much as 4.4%, sometimes it's gone up by as little as 1.1%. 1 
The important thing to keep in mind is that this is a trend based on the 2018 provider list. So this is basically a series of hypothetical populations based on that performance list. So these aren't the same people that were, this wouldn't be the same trend line as we would draw today based on the 2019 provider list. So uh, just the important thing, it's a lot harder to think about trends when your base is changing all the time. <coughs> Um, yeah, and so for the um, all-payer target, it's a little bit simpler in terms of wrapping your mind around, in my opinion. Uh, so basically, this is more of a straight compounding annual growth rate. 2017 is going to be our base through the course of the entire agreement. Um, and for this, we'll also have the same target the entire time, and that's a performance to date of 3.5% or less. Uh, and so far, oh, we are coming in and I think we're on track. We see a growth rate estimated to be 2.5%. Uh, this is going to change for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that with more run out, uh, you'll see the growth just in Q2 year over year is 0.7%. With additional run out, we expect that will increase. Uh, not as high as Q1 came in. We don't expect it to go as high as 4.3, but it will go up. Uh, also, we're using a placeholder for a provision in the agreement. So it allows us to treat certain Medicaid price increases in a special way. So if um, Medicaid is increasing its reimbursement to either narrow the gap with Medicare or increase access to services, then we're not on the hook for those increases. So we're using 6.6% .6 as a placeholder and uh, we're actually working with our partners right now to actually reprice those claims that were incurred in 2018 back to the 2017 prices, and the Medicaid portion of the all-payer will be replaced by those values. And just, you know, to keep, try and keep our eye on the ball, our Medicare growth target is always going to be performance to date being 0.2% below national projections. So there are no annual targets for our Medicare total cost of care. It's always the performance period to date. Uh, we recently got the estimate for uh, 2020, so we'll be able to update you very soon on what that means for our performance goals. And uh, because 2017 is the base, we now know what our goal is for 2022 for the all-payer target. So we came in at 496 as our estimated base for the entire year. 3.5% um, growth would put us at 591 per person per month in 2022. However, we wouldn't expect uh, corrective action to be triggered based on this until it hits $614 per member per month. Um, these numbers might change a little bit. Uh, again, just with additional run out, they might go change a little bit, but they're gonna be pretty final at this point. Um, the only other reason we might see something material change is that um, in future years of the agreement, there are additional services that we are likely to fold in uh, on the Medicaid side of things. And so we would obviously want our base to reflect that change. So uh, those are the only kind of main things, but I think for the most part, you could uh, hang your hat on these numbers. Okay. Questions from the board? Great. Um. <coughs> okay, so I have a couple questions. One um, for Marissa. When you look at slide five, um, you talk about the uh, population health management reform program and also the quarterly tracking. Um, one suggestion would be, since this was an area that the ACL fell short in last year, is asking them also for a projection when they come in. So if in Q1, you know, obviously we hope they're gonna be spending you know, at the 3.5%, was it 3.1%? But if they're coming in lower, like what's the projection for the rest of the year? So that we can get ahead of if in fact, you know, they're tracking behind, which at the beginning of the year they may be, and they're supposed to catch up by year end. But last year we really didn't know about that until the end of the year. So I'll kind of leave it up to you guys as, as how do we do that so we can make sure we'll get a quarter one number and then understand where they're going to track for the year to make sure they're going to stay on track with that target. Just going to say, I'm, I would maybe phone a friend for this one, but I'm getting a nod from our financial analyst in the back there that that seems like something that we could do. Okay. 
And then my next question is for Sarah on slide 20. And it's more of a comment too from a format. Um, one thing that might be helpful is at the bottom to put, um, you know, prior quarters. So meaning, you know, at the end of Q1, what was that line looking like? So it was just, we would have just had Q1 performance. And then so when we get into Q3, we'd actually have three rows, right? You'd have kind of Q1 and where were we? Q2, we know we're at 2.5% at this point, but it will show what you're saying, which is, you know, we, we don't expect 0.7% to be in Q2, but it'll help for, I know it'll help for me to be able to see how does the trend build, so that when we get to the end of the year, we'll have, you know, Q, Q1, we'll have, you know, four data points, and we'll see how much did it change. Q2 would have three, Q3, Q2, and then, you know, we can at least start to say, oh, well, we can see, you know, if we projected that forward. And, and the reason why is because we don't want people to pick up the wrong number and say, oh, we're running at 2.5%, even though you've caveated that it doesn't have a full run out, you know, let, yet we won't see, so. Great idea. Okay. But that's it. Tom? <clears throat> Just sticking to uh, slide 20 here, um, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the all pair model has that pair differ differential uh, paragraph 10 in it. And um, look, a reasonable person looking at it, I think, could interpret it in a number of different ways. Uh, but ultimately, that the final interpretation is between the state and CMS, which I understand is going on. The issue is um, whether or not uh, to differentiate between any Medicaid increase or um, is there a way to calculate Medicaid increases that close the payer differential or uh, increase access? And obviously, every rate increase, one could interpret increases access. So I, my understanding is that, there, that as we go forward, there will be two sets of these um, uh, tables um, presented so that we can see uh, clearly how much is being excluded from the total cost of care calculation. Um, Understanding that the the, the most the six percent number includes that settlement with Dartmouth, and therefore it's probably an anomaly. But going forward, that those numbers should change and may or may not be significant. Um, uh, is that your understanding as well? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't include both sets of tables <coughs> in the hopes of reducing confusion. But yeah, we're we're tracking it both with and without that adjustment. Okay, other questions? Just yes. a quick one on the, the NORC evaluation. Um, it, it just, are there going to be interim reports from them? Is it just an evaluation at the end? And I'm wondering the timeline when we're going to see interim yeah. reports. Um, looking at the timeline yesterday, it, I think the first report that we'll receive is 18 months from, so in, in a year and a half from 2019 is okay. when we'll receive our first report. So we'll receive several through the life of the agreement. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, anything else from the board? If not, I'll open it up to the public for any questions or comments. Susan. Yes. Um, can you tell us what the current attribution is by the I don't have the numbers now on that, so we do not have those numbers. Um, can I give you an email? Yep, I would also say that when One Care comes in May, they will pr be providing their final attribution numbers. They were still finalizing their commercial number um, at the time that we were putting this presentation together. And that is why the scale targets and that slide are still estimates. My understanding, I guess I'm going to ask you guys. So, my understanding, Mr. Chair, is that um, the attribution has to be finalized of January 1. Like, they can't they prospectively attribute, they can't add, in ACO, can't add new lives after January 1. So it's April 10th now. <coughs> so are the numbers final for 2019? Or not? So the numbers for Medicaid and Medicare are finalized. The commercial number is final as well. With commercial, the reason why it takes several months for them to run their final attribution for the year is because they need to wait to know 
who the population is that is enrolled in the QHP program. And they will not know that until the end of January, beginning of February. And then they start to run their attribution. Other questions or comments on the public? Seeing none, thank you very much. And uh, David and Jess, come on down. Yeah, um, well, they make their way up here. I just um, <coughs> want to give people a little bit of uh, background. So the, the, our A team is working hard on trying to produce more responsive information so if you have like a question at a summary level or want to do a deeper dive we're trying to produce products that offer both those um, options so anything we produce we're going to make sure that there is data available for that um, we're also trying to release things at a maybe more immature stage just to give people a chance to react to them and give us um, suggestions for improvement so um, we do encourage you to send us any feedback about how we could make this information more useful, and with that, I'll turn it off to the, the people who actually did the work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jessica Mendizable. And this is David Glad. And um, so, what we're going to show you today is a dashboard that represents the total cost of care over time, um, starting with 2012 through 2017, which is um, our most recent data. And we have a uh, a couple of uh, just things to note about the data. Um, it's a resident look, and I know Sarah actually went through a lot of this, but just for a reminder, this is based on where people live and not necessarily when they're receiving care. Um, it's limited to those that are in V-Cures, and um, the data is tied to a, a primary payer type, so I know Sarah explained that, but um, this is to ensure that we are only counting uh, a person one time. So uh, uh, one more, yes, some of some care. So this is excluding um, all of those things that Sarah had mentioned. And I'll just note that um, if, uh, if you click here, you'll uh, link to our website uh, where there's a document that describes the background and methodology and all of those caveats are noted there. Um, while we're on the cover sheet, the data is also available for download. So what we're showing you today doesn't include everything that's in the data set. So folks are welcome to come and, and take a look at what else is included and let us know your questions and what else you might want to see um, out of this data. So the dashboard has two different looks. If you click the tabs up at the top, we are going to <coughs> take a minute and uh, look at the per member per month cost over time. So um, there's a lot of different ways to filter here. On the left hand side, um, it's small, but it's showing by year and it's gonna default to 2017. If you use the slider bar, um, and you can kind of take that all the way back to 2012, we can click through um, the years and just see how the heat map is changing over time. So if we click, the lighter shades are representative of the lower cost per member per month, and you know the darker shades are representing a uh, higher cost there. Uh, we can also filter by payer. So right now this is showing the all payer, but if you wanted to drill down by payer, you can see um, how it's changing by year and payer. You could take a look at um, the different years over time for payer. And the map itself is also a filter. So if you wanted to drill down into a specific hospital service area, you could click on a hospital service area. And then the graphs on the right-hand side and the tables will adjust to the amounts that are uh, representative of that service area. So just some neat interactive ways to view the data. Um, the table at the bottom is showing you the per site difference um, from each previous year. So 2012 is white because we don't have uh, something to compare that to. That's our base year. Um, any questions on this look? One question. Sure. On, um, so in this particular look for the Medicare total cost of care, this is a subset of the all pair total cost of care, not the, what you explained earlier about what we're doing in the first three years of the agreement. Is that accurate? Right. Okay. Yeah. And the, ultimately, in the hours, <coughs> they'll be one of the same. But right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the second look uh, looks at members. 
And it functions similar to, uh, to that first look, but um, we're showing you know, um, members over time. And again, if we're clicking on a different HSA, you can see uh, how it's changing over time. And one thing to note here in the line graph, if we're looking at commercial, the drop here in members is due to the GoBay decision where we uh, don't have those self-funded reporting to be cures any longer. And again, you can drill down and look uh, by payer and the map will change. And if you're curious, you can take a look at each HSA over time. Jess, will we continue to see uh a drop due to the GoBay decision, and is there anything that we can do proactively to try to encourage people to report? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I don't have the answer for that, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, we are seeing more and more fully insured groups choosing to self-insure, um, and many of those have access to the, uh, the exemption. So in that way, we might see uh, slight drops. I don't think it will be anywhere near as dramatic as this. And I think the best thing that we can do is that this is a decision that's ultimately up to the employer. So um, reaching out to employers and encouraging them to submit their data is the best thing that we can do. And uh, on our team, one of our, our missions is to kind of provide some data products that might be more useful to an employer group. So kind of providing benchmarks and stuff within that population. Benchmarks is a strong word, but information of, about variability and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, this interaction or visualization is available from the Green Mountain Care Board website under analytics, uh, analytic reports. And um, <clears throat> there is, uh, as I said, the data set is available and um, you know, future looks might include a breakout by age category per payer, um, as well as utilization by type of care. Yeah, and just so people know, the age group breakout's already in the download, and it also has it on a quarterly basis, so there's a much more nuanced data set. Any questions? I have a question back on the other chart, the all payer um, total cost of care chart that you showed. How do we think about um, <coughs> looking at the all payer bottom, you know, the numbers at the bottom? For 2018, it was 5.2, and 2017, it's 6.8. So how does that correlate to the 3.5? And if there are differences, how can we bridge back to those when we're going to be looking at each year? Well, that's, that's also a Sarah question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, so 17 is our base, so we're not seeing any of that yet. But um, so yeah, so basically, you know, these are the terms that would be the components of the compounded growth rate. So if you wanted to calculate it from um, 12 to 17, you could, you know, do it back in the napkin and figure out what that is. But they should tick and tie. I think somebody once said. Okay. <laughs> so the history is so. So in 18, when we see a number that number should tie to what we're going to be using the total cost of care. Yeah, and we didn't include 18 because it's only a partial year. We right. just thought that for this, we should try and keep it as apples to apples as possible. But that said, there's obviously a population shift um, that makes it not so great for trending with the GoBay thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but in 17 and 18, though, the numbers are. Yeah, 17 and 17, 17, the numbers are high. Exactly. And year change. So to be able to get to a 3.5. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I know you and the team, the A team over there, this is the start of many wonderful products to come, say products, but uh, data analytics. Do you want to just share with folks some of the things that you think are thinking about how you're going to use this data and other things that you can look forward to? <laughs> sure. Um, well, David's uh, working on completing one related to the hospital budget process that I'm super excited about. Um, there'll be kind of two different looks. One is like a really kind of like what we've been missing, in my opinion, is like that 30,000 kind of simple, stupid look of the comparison over time. But he's also gonna been working really closely with some people to try and think of some more like granular information to provide at the hospital level. So uh, that should be at, what do you think, David? What do we have? 
April. End of April. End of the month. So we'll be releasing that one. Um, the next one I think that we want to turn our attention to is like a market composition kind of look, and that will be broader than the data sources that we have. So how has that changed over time? How are people covered? Kind of that crosswalk of multiple coverages. So how many people with commercial also have Medicare, that kind of stuff. Um, and then also we would really like to do so more with the hospital discharge data, and that would be more about um, patient origin and how that's changing over time, and, and you know how it varies by the type of service. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we're also we've got a lot of exciting projects. Those are the ones in the nearest term, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, David just wanted to point out one more thing. So I just, I know. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, 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 the um, visualizations can be accessed through links that we have um, um, through our data and analytics website, through the JMCB site. Um, but I just want to point out that, that the, visualiz those, the hyperlinks take you to what's called Tableau Public. So anybody can just log into Tableau Public, or not, you don't have to log in, you just search for Tableau Public. And within this search menu here, you just put in GMC. I, I put a bunch of tags in, so uh, GMCB usually works pretty well. Um, and you can get into our visualization page. And if you go to the, uh, the side up here. so up here, the state of Vermont, you'll see that we've got a couple of, we have the expenditure analysis up. So this is where we'll, we'll be our repository. Uh, for future visualizations. In fact, uh, we're going to post one that was produced by Marissa Melamed um, that's also a, a sort of a different look at total cost of care. Um, we think it's very interesting. So this, this is the, the area that if you do not want to go searching through our website to try to find a link to it, you can just go to Tab Public and do a search at the top for GMCB or Greenbelt or Airborne. Um, I forget the other tags, but it's pretty, pretty easy to find. And if you want to create a, an account, you can do that as well. Um, I was then, trying to get followers. Then, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was new to this whole thing, so I know that the more likes, the better. Right? So you get notified then when there's a new prop. You know, Not product. yet. I think you have to get to 100, and then yeah. you're, you're in at that point. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to inundate you and have the system crash. Exactly. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Tom? So as we go forward, um, are, is it the intent to develop a, a kind of a parallel set of, uh, of Tableau screens having to do with uh, population health targets in, in the all fair model? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've been talking about um, how we can better kind of demonstrate key performance indicators, if you will, and I think that there will be probably a dashboard dedicated to those, including quality measures. Those are a little bit, um, the cadence of those is a little bit slower, so it's always like hard when you just show one year, but that doesn't mean we won't, won't do that. <laughs> it's just harder to interpret a single. I'm just, just wondering about the uh, statistical reliability of, of you know, you kind of want to compare the two intuitively, but it might not be statistically uh, um, a, a, an appropriate approach um, in trying to say, oh gee, you know, population health is going down in this HSA, and, uh, and the money's going down, so the all-payer model is working, and you know, that's an association that may or may not be true. So when you, when you get down to a more granular level off the kind of total population down to the HSA level, is there a limit, or is there, are there some HSAs where uh, the data just has a, a wide margin of, uh, of, uh, of margin of error around it? Uh, so when I think about the, the question you're asking is so there's like two different kind of things that are going through my head. One is like a lot of what we're tracking is um, like what actually happened. So it's not really estimated. It's like we know how many suicides occurred. So in that way, there's not really error around that. However, there is noise, meaning that a smaller population is going to bounce around a lot more than a larger population. So in that way, it's harder to interpret changes, um, which is why it's nice to have kind of a longitudinal look just to see like how noisy the curve has been. 
And there are some techniques we can use to try and smooth it out. So if you wanted to like go to a rolling five-year average for something like suicide, that's a way that you can kind of help control for some of that. And in that case, you could put a confidence interval around it and figure out what's you know statistically significant. But I would look, you know, in a lot of these matters, I think kind of the, the effect size, like if it makes your jaw drop, statistics don't matter. <laughs> you know, like but, you know, you gotta kind of there's a gut check with a lot of these numbers. Questions? Great, and again, we welcome feedback um, as what we can do and keep producing. Um, so these kind of things are designed that when I think of analysis, there's like kind of this exploratory look where we're not really doing much to interpret anything. We're just kind of giving people self-serve access to try and answer their own questions. I think another kind of way we'll likely go is more like a data brief where we offer more like interpretation where appropriate and kind of put things into context. So. Um, these intentionally don't involve any interpretation. <laughs> All right. so, so we'll open it up to public uh, comments or questions. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, I was, if we're all kind of moving towards the direction of surfing up more information and, you know, presumably, like, and, and this is a criticism of our own work, my, my office's work too, is, uh, you know, I think as one group that's accessing this information is consumers. And I think we all need to begin to think about how consumers get to these things and whether going through the board's current model of the website makes sense. So I think that's something we've struggled with with our website and consumer information is like, is this really the best way to get it to consumers? Or are we all living in this world where we're locked into web systems that were designed in the past and aren't really aligned with what we're trying to develop the products for. And I think, you know, at some point, obviously not now, but as these tools keep developing, I think it is a project our office is looking at and I think the board should probably consider is does the current way this information is served to the public actually make sense? Or should we be all be looking at a different way of serving it up that isn't buried in, you know, the analytics tab of the Green Mountain Care Board. Well, we'd love to work with you yeah. on trying to uh, get it as user-friendly as possible. It's <coughs> discouraging when you get a public comment. Um, <coughs> we have, we've had some public comments that they believe that most of the things that are on our website are written for um, either insurance industries or um, medical administrators, and that's not the purpose. The purpose of the website is for Vermonters. So uh, as you're having that conversation, if you have any great ideas that we are <coughs> hearing about, please share with us. No, and it's something else we'll talk with Sarah about and work with her, but I think it's a really high level thing that's kind of above our pay grade, right? Like my pay grade isn't works, you know, the web stuff happens at a much higher level than me, and I think your guys' web stuff happens at a much higher level, so I'm just throwing I this I couldn't idea. tell you how it happens, Eric. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what I would just chime in is there are some state limitations yes. that yeah. we are subject to, as you yeah. probably know, that having in the past tried to make uh, better websites, <laughs> we do <laughs> run into uh, challenges at yeah. the state level with other agencies. Other questions or comments from the public? Yeah. I just got a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman, about the, uh, about the ERISA companies and the GoBay issue. Um, I'm curious, the, uh, I, my one question is, I think that the, that the ERISA company could agree to um, buy, in other words, you go through one care to get a fixed price contract for their care with a me medical thing, okay? With there's, there's no question that we hope that over time, as more people are using the accountable care organization, that we're gonna get better data. But what we were talking about earlier was trying to figure out if we could try to coerce them into- um, Encourage. Encourage. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage. Coerce is absolutely right. And I, <laughs> But I'm clear, does, do we have any ERISA companies that will report voluntarily? 
We have some in there today, um, and we actually shout out to our partners at Blue Cross Blue Shield. They did a lot of outreach, so 80% of the people that wouldn't have to submit are submitting voluntarily in their book of business. So there's only a 20% lag in there? For Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the other, just a comment, Mr. Chairman, and that is that the, that issue, the question of, how, the, the Tom brought it up too, I mean, how do you move that? Basically a, it's basically a political question. My guess is, for example, if Rich Tarrant doesn't run IDX anymore, but if he did, okay, and he had, he had the full protection of the Gobey decision by the Supreme Court, but if, the, but if the governor went to him and said, listen, we really need you to do this for the state, Rich would have done it the next day. And so I think that it is a, my opinion, just a comment, maybe it's, that and eight bucks get you coffee, but the, um, but the, I think that it's a political problem and that it's not, it's not anywhere far from impossible to make a lot of progress here and to push, you might e be pretty easily able to push into the last, into Sarah's last 20% and end up with a residual that was, was it insignificant. That's it. Thank you. I just want to point out him that you can get coffee now for 50 cents at Burger King. <laughs> How good is the coffee? I actually think the coffee is very, very good at McDonald's and they put it in a cup that keeps it nice and warm and you can reuse that cup over and over again. It's a pretty good deal. And they'll give you a card every fifth one, you get a free one. <laughs> Any other public comment? Yes. John. I have a question, John from the Department of Health. Um, hey, Sarah. Um, using the heat maps and the tableau, I, I love that idea and being able to see the uh, data over time and also how it changes. Um, one of the questions I'm, I'm not clear about because probably I can't see the screen, I haven't looked in that uh, data set, is over each year, that map is going to get uh, darker and darker and darker. How much of that is because of either inflation or something like that? Um, and how do you suggest that casual users of that data set um, understand how that, um, how more, how the costs keep going up? And is, is there a median for the state that's listed in each year? So people can say, oh, my HSA is above or below, below the state median. How, any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the way that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I believe that the, the color coding resets within each year. Yeah, that's okay. So it wouldn't all get darker over time. Is that right, guys? Yes. Okay. So, so it's so, like a yeah. high group and a mid group and a low group each year. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it, and when you download it, you could certainly adjust for inflation if you if you chose to. Um, but the, that all payer value is what I would consider as kind of the the average or the the, the benchmark for the state. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions or comments? Sam, just one more question for Sarah. Sarah, if the 80% of the ERISAs are in, okay, uh, that if it was a statistical uh, test, that would be a hell of a sample. And could it would would it be valid to simply project the results of the 80 over the other 20, and then take that as a um, as a, a piece of a piece of a datum that would have value. So the tricky thing is that um, basically the half of the market covered by Cigna doesn't have that great of comply or didn't choose to voluntarily submit at that rate. So we're we're missing about half of the self-funded population. So Blue Cross has been a great partner in trying to get us. So the, so the overall number is fifty, not eighty. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a lot more than Cigna. You got Aetna and. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the most, Sigma's got about half that business, and that's about what we're missing. And um, yeah, and uh, I would say, so the, the other kind of confounder that makes it a tricky tr statistical exercise is that certain self-funded groups don't have a choice. They still have to do it. And those are municipal groups, the state of Vermont, UVM. So no matter what, the teachers union. So the groups that still have to submit and are the great proportion of business left have much richer plans and aren't a great representation of the population at large, unfortunately. Okay, other questions or comments? So seeing none, thank right. you very much. We're going to recess the board meeting till one o'clock this afternoon, at which time we'll take up the enforcement hearings for Bob Scutney, 
and four north country. So everybody can back promptly up on that would be great. So welcome back everyone. We're going to turn it over to uh, staff to uh, tee us up for the, the first hearing. So Lori. Good afternoon. This is Lori Perry and Agatha Kessler. We are giving a brief rundown of um, Mount Scutney's enforcement discussion for today. And we, this is our second day of enforcement hearings for review. And we will be showing the actual for fiscal year 18. We will be um, also the fiscal year 19 year date as of February 28, 2019. The fiscal year 19 forecast, five year results, and dis the discussion with Mon Scutney will be at the right after this. So this is what we, uh, Mon Scutney submitted the FY18 budget and the board approved um, the 48682309, and we also adjusted their budget for DISH, and we approved their fiscal year 19 budget um, at 51195770. We are having discussions, minor housekeeping with Mom Scutney because of our data in our software. So that's what that note right there means for the $756,000. Um, for fiscal year 18, the submitted and approved charge or rate that we used to call it was 4.9%. For fiscal year 19, the submitted and approved uh, charge was 2.9%. For fiscal year 18 actuals from our Stepney, we're seeing a 4.4% variance from the budget for NPR and FPP and a 1% variance from the operating expenses. They are, have a 1.9% margin, a 5.3% total margin, and day's cash on hand is 187.8 as of September 30th. For the actual to actual comparison, 17 to 18, the NPR FPP change was 5.3%, the operating expenses changed 6.1%, and we talk about points for these percentages of operating margin. So they had a drop in points of 0.8% for operating margin, 5.2% for total margin. And they had almost 11 days change in their day's cash on hand. Fiscal year 19, what we are currently receiving from the hospital. This is year to date, February 28th. The NPR that we're seeing is 1.7% negative to their budget. Their operating expenses is 1.7% positive. The operating margin is a negative 1.5%. The total margin is a negative 0.9%, and they're at 177.5 days cash on hand. And then some of these Figures are based on our calculations and some of it is based on their day's cash on here. Um, 18, actually, actually 18 to 19, the NPR and FPP change is 2.3%. They have a change in operating expenses of 6.1%. And the operating margin is 1.8%. Total margin 4.4%. And days cash on hand, we don't have that information this time. Uh, Mana Scutney has projected for fiscal year 19, their NPR FPP for year end is 51,9,51,77. The operating expenses are 54,837,975. There was no change in the operating margin, total margin change of 1.6%. And then the day's cash on hand is 176.4. We were given, um, asked to give a five year results for their NPR and FPP and a five year figure. And for our records, we have a 
five-year cable. And the number for their fiscal year 19 is what we will be asking to um, have Mount Scutton either change and adapt it or we'll be talking again with them to find out what the correct number is for their budget. Their operating expenses, five-year CAGR is 2.1%. The operating margin five-year results for Monscutney are here. As of 2014, they were a negative 463,804. For fiscal year 18, they're a million fifty-two thousand two hundred twenty-five, and they're expecting 17,584 for their fiscal year 19. Total margin in 2014 was 216,182. In 2018, it was 2,986,749. Just to give kind of an idea of the change through all those years. Any questions on the data that we're showing you? Any questions? So then we can have my discussion come up. Great. Dr. Harris. Swear, all firm, the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Ready for us? We are. Okay. Tell us your story. Yes, so good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, uh, after we uh, closed the books on February of 19, I wanted to add another slide to our presentation entitled A Tale of Two Cities. And for, <laughs> Folks that remember reading that uh, Dickens nightmare uh, in high school or college starts out with it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And our swing in the last couple months have uh, kind of raised the, uh, raised the issue of how tenuous even good performance can be um, uh, in Vermont. So uh, I'll be providing a fair amount of color commentary while Dave Sandel, my, the, my chief financial officer, We'll be providing a lot of the, the detail work at, as we move through our presentation. I think in general, we probably have too much information for this enforcement hearing, so I'll rely on Dave to editorialize as, as we go through and leave time for the questions. We will be talking about the drivers of our uh, NPR FPP variance, the drivers of our operating margin variance. Um, uh, we'll, we don't have to deal with uh, bullet three. Uh, uh, this time around. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, in depth our year-to-date results through February of 19 and our uh, forecast uh, for the rest of, of this year. So with that, I'm going to transition over to Dave. Um, so to be honest with you, we weren't really sure how much detail or how little detail we have been here for this type of hearing before. So. Uh, feel free to uh, say less or more as we go along, and I'll be uh, willing to adjust uh, the amount of information coming from my mouth. So, uh, gross patient revenue uh, for FY18, we actually had every line of business exceeding uh, gross revenue targets uh, for the year, so that was very positive. Uh, acute inpatient revenue was up 23%. Uh, discharges were up 10%, and the days were up 12%. Uh, but really the big gain in the 23% revenue uh, variance came from uh, a disproportionate number of inpatient surgeries. Uh, typically, we might have one, maybe two a month. Uh, we had some months last year, we were having six. So uh, that was really the driver uh, on the inpatient side of, of that favorable variance. And uh, we had a very high case mix because of the uh, disproportionate number of inpatient surgeries. Our acute inpatient rehab unit, uh, the revenue was up 6% from budget, and uh, although discharges were down a little bit, uh, the days were up uh, 2%, and again, we had a higher case mix. And usually, if you look at days, discharges aren't so, so relevant, but a uh, number of days are. And uh, if you say well, days are up 2%, then your revenue should have been up 2%. 
but it's up 6%. Usually that's an indicator of, of a higher case mix. Uh, our swing bed or sub-Q unit was up 6% uh, in gross revenue as well. Um, their discharges uh, were up 12.5%, uh, and uh, but days were only up 1.8%, which means we had a lot more turnover and a shorter length of stay on the average patient, uh, which is usually an indicator of lower acuity and lower case mix index. Uh, and then we have a, a typo in here. Uh, that uh, we have, uh, we talked about this last year in a couple of our presentations uh, up here, and that was uh, we had uh, seven to nine boarders residing at Mount Escutney for uh, several months each. In fact, some uh, broke the one year mark and one approached two years, as I recall. And we have 2,000 patient days of ICF level care rendered in the med surge unit, and really that number is more like 10,000. So, uh, and so we've been aggressively working on that for almost a year now, and we're down to just a couple. So I don't know if Joe wants to comment. Yeah, I think, actually, numbers closer to 1,000, not 10, not 10, oh, 10. Yeah, sorry. Um, we, we had four patients who were in the hospital for a calendar year, um, and uh, uh, it was a remarkable stress on the institution. Um, so while it looks like our, we report on our stats, our patient days were are much higher than usual. These are folks that, lost their skilled needs many months previously and we're just getting ICF level care basically nursing home level care custodial care in the hospital and that goes to the uh, uh, issues around you know what's the next step for these patients and as nursing homes close uh, as there's not enough capacity in adult group homes and all of the post-acute care issues um, we really felt it um, now we, the promising bit is that we, we actually brought in a new uh, director of care management who's been thinking differently about some of these things. We've been able to find the next appropriate step um, for a big chunk of those folks, but it's still a significant stressor for the organization. It's not just the financial stress, it's our nurses, our acute care nurses who are spending a lot of their time with custodial care. It's our, our hospitalists that are functioning like uh, they're working in a nursing home. That's not why they, not why they got into the business. So. Um, a little bit of a typo there. It's the number is, is about having just done the math again last night about fifteen hundred patient days with those with those nine uh, seven to nine patients depending on the month. Can I just follow up question on that, Doctor Paris? Um, you, you talked about it uh, due to a uh, reduction in the number of nursing home beds available. I'm curious if, if it's actually a problem with nursing home beds available or if the patients um, just weren't accepted by the nursing home facility? Yeah, I mean, it's a mix. Uh, we have overall in the state, the number of nursing home beds has decreased. Um, and I know it's a lot of it is county specific. We probably had about 150 beds come offline in Windsor County um, in the last five to 10 years. So that hurts, but it's also the willingness or ability of these nursing homes to take Medicaid patients. And all, every one of those board of patients had long-term care through Medicaid. I mean, every single one of them. There wasn't, there wasn't a private pay amongst them. So you can kind of do the math there. Yep. Yeah. I would add to that one of the issues we run into as a border hospital is the nursing home beds are open across the river in New Hampshire, and the patient is covered by Vermont Medicaid and trying to figure out how to make that jump for the patient uh, happen and, and for the family is, is very difficult because, uh, uh, and then you, when you've got people staying you know, 200 days, <coughs> guess what, they're a resident of Vermont. So even if they had New Hampshire Medicaid, now it's kind of a question. So these are some of the complexities that, that we have to deal with being across the river. Uh, going on with the discussion of gross patient revenue, outpatient was up 4.5% from budget, and most of what we call our core outpatient stats uh, were very favorable. The only one that was unfavorable was the OR, uh, but chemotherapy, infusion therapy, uh, all the radiology uh, modalities, laboratory, emergency, were, were all up for the year, and that resulted in that 4.5% favorable variance. Um, physician provider revenue was actually slightly above budget. Uh, the hospital-based and uh, specialty providers, surgeons and the like, uh, all did fairly well in volume as well, but our primary care uh, uh, department 
in the two locations uh, did struggle, uh, but they did finish favorable to budget relative to revenue. So total gross patient service revenue was up 5%. Um, we had no new programs. We didn't really expand any programs uh, or enhance programs. Uh, uh, Joe was going to talk a little bit about uh, primary care transition because that's been kind of an ongoing discussion uh, with you folks for a number of years and talk a little bit about the services. I, I've spoken at a, a couple of budget presentations around our desire uh, as an institution to get off the, the boom bust cycle of, of uh, hospital finance in the sense that we, we just talked about this this morning at the at our VAS board meeting of one, you know, the, the departure of one orthopedic surgeon can be the difference <laughs> between life and, life and death uh, of, of a balance sheet. Um, so we have made a conscious effort to move away from that. And the, uh, in the absence of, of adding you know, the pod, urology service, what have you, um, you know, we live and die on our, our core mission, which is around primary care and our rehabilitation. <coughs> services. Uh, we have been suffering with a lack of access in primary care for the last few years. We had a major exodus uh, four, four and a half years ago, docs due to retirement, relocation, just getting out of the <coughs> business altogether. Um, and so we, uh, we, we've struggled in, in the outpatient space. And you know, I think that the question that arises is, that, does that drive some of the emergency room? Volume. Are there things that could be happening in the primary care clinic that couldn't happen and were sent to the ER instead? So happy to update that we've hired three primary care docs in the last uh, six weeks and we'll be um, in a much better place with much better access. Um, and as you'll see when we talk about 19, some of the other improvements that we've done around access in our, in our work with better outpatient care management um, is actually um, driving some of the inpatient business down because we're better managing folks in the outpatient setting. So as I, Dave and I will constantly talk about what makes me happy from an ACO standpoint, it makes him unhappy from a CFO standpoint. And that's, that's the balance uh, that, that, that we have to follow. Now, relative to uh, deductions from revenue, uh, generally speaking, uh, if your gross revenue is up 5%, you would expect your uh, deductions to be also up 5%, but changes in lines of, within lines of business or uh, with the payer mix uh, change that number. And so our deductions were up 5.8% uh, utilizing your reporting methodology. And uh, uh, when we throw in bad debt and free care on our end, it, it was up 7.3% uh, on in our purview. And 5% uh, of that was really related to utilization uh, and the remainder uh, was up uh, due to changes in payer mix. Uh, we had less government, uh, less commercial and Blue Cross and, and more government. Uh, we did get some of that back because Medicare was the government payer that grew the most. So uh, when we filed our cost report, we were able to mitigate that at year end. We always run an interim cost report uh, at, uh, well, in, budget season and then at the year end to make sure our books are closed uh, correctly. Uh, this resulted in uh, net patient revenue uh, that was, again, favorable as your as staff already reported and 2.9% uh, if we don't include the FPP and 4.4% uh, if we do. So hence, uh, we're sitting here today. Uh, other operating uh, revenue, uh, again, from going, going from my books to your books, uh, we moved that FPP up, uh, so it's reflected in the net patient revenue. Uh, but the uh, remaining uh, other operating room uh, revenue was extremely favorable. Uh, we received $290,000 in the meaningful use funds, which will probably be the last amount that we'll be receiving of any significance. Uh, we had $100,000 in group purchasing rebates come through the Dartmouth-Hitchcock group purchasing system. Um, and uh, really the other notable one is really the 222,000 340B revenues, which we're, we're always trying to stay on top of and trying to make sure we're getting what we can out of that system. Um, our big concern, and we've mentioned this the last few times we've been here, is that you know our reliance 
on something other than a core business, which is taking care of patients, is a growing concern, floating in a margin uh, with services that really aren't our core services. So overall, our, our total net revenues went up 5.5% uh, uh, positively. Expenses, uh, we did a really good job of managing expenses. That tends to be what we do. And any expense that we have control or management of, I feel like we do a pretty good job of that year in, year out. Um, we had a 5% volume increase, loosely speaking, and, and uh, our expense increase was only 1%, and that really speaks to two issues in my mind. One is that we are doing a good job managing expenses, but secondarily, uh, and this has come up also in other hearings, is uh, that we have a large percentage of fixed costs in the critical access hospital. And so oftentimes when we uh, uh, have more volume than expected, we're able to absorb that in the overhead that we already have. And so I think those two things are, are what you need to take away from, from that particular uh, discussion. Uh, salaries and purchase labor uh, put uh, a great deal of pressure on our expenses. They were up 1.75 million, uh, and that was with a favorable FTE count. So we were under budget for a number of FTEs, but because of locums and traveler costs, um, that really, uh, uh, we really ballooned up in, in the total salary and, and labor costs. Market salary competition, so we're um, we're in a little bit different uh, situation. You're, uh, North Country will probably speak to the same thing. Uh, we're competing with New Hampshire, uh, not only the other Vermont hospitals, but New Hampshire, which is essentially the Wild West with healthcare finance. So we're constantly trying to stay in the game with that, and uh, in order to get the uh, uh, to replace some of these travelers, uh, we need to we need to address that and at least stay in the game. We'll never be a, a market industry leader, but uh, we need to be staying in the game. Uh, we also, uh, purchase labor went up uh, because we have uh, been renting a few managers from Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, to manage areas of our facility. And to be quite frank, if I were to pick one thing that has been extremely beneficial from our relationship with Dartmouth, it is some of those folks that we have brought in to fill positions. Uh, within our organization, getting another level of expertise, knowledge, and skill. Uh, they have to kind of retrain their mind to think like a critical access hospital, uh, but the, the ones that are in my mind as I speak right now have been fabulous, fabulous improvements for, for our organization. And then travelers and locals, you guys I'm sure are uh, aware of that ad nauseum, so I won't speak to that. Uh, we did have favorable benefits to offset that uh, by almost $100,000. Uh, supplies were only up 1% despite 5% volume increase. Uh, purchase services were down 7.4%. We're really careful about uh, the consulting and uh, uh, service contracts we sign. Uh, we're able to leverage uh, some of Dartmouth's terms and pricing for some of our service contracts. Um, we're very aggressive in our negotiations with vendors and uh, have done fairly well in, in knocking that, that number down. That was about 335,000 uh, for last, last year. Utilities, uh, we've talked about our ongoing energy saving efforts and uh, we do consider ourselves a leader within the state of Vermont uh, relative to that and we are seeing those savings in our utility uh, costs. Rent equipment and basically all other expenses. Uh, again, we just scrutinized some of our IT subscriptions and were the things we could do within the facility and not contract out. Um, specialized uh, patient equipment, bariatric beds, for instance, some of those types of things. We, the frequency of you renting those items for specific patients had grown to a level where it made more sense for us to buy and no longer rent, so that accounts for about 120000 in savings. I believe this time last year we spoke to you about our workers' comp carrier looking at a 150% premium increase, um, and uh, we were actually able to save money on that. Uh, it was uh, Mr. Toe's wild ride, but uh, we got through it, and uh, that contributed heavily towards uh, saving uh, a fair amount of money the last several months of last year. And uh, provider tax, we actually paid $40,000 less in the year than we anticipated, so we're happy. Um, interest and depreciation, we, we didn't uh, buy everything that we had on our schedule to buy, and uh, we have some favorable borrowing rates that we were able to get through Dartmouth Hitchcock. So as a result, we also saved about 270000 in those areas. 
Just a, a quick point, I, I mentioned this at prior budget presentations. Um, our historical strength in expense management and reduction is what's kept us in the game when, um, when, when volumes weren't what they were, what, what we expected they would be. Um, so I think what 18 showed was ongoing focus on our expense reduction, but in the setting of we actually had higher than expected uh, volume. So uh, the stars aligned for a year, and as we talk about 19, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit of a, of a misalignment. Uh, I'll let Dave run with it from there. So we did uh, make our operating budget, so we're skipping the next bullet point. And going to uh, results as of February 28, 2019, uh, the short story is we're about $700,000 behind budget uh, on operating margin uh, through five months. and. Uh, it's kind of, a, as I use internally at the hospital, uh, kind of a lot of death by a million paper cuts. Uh, I don't think we have any one thing that is running away from us or, or creating chaos that we cannot get in front of. Um, but we can start right at the top of the P&L and uh, we can talk about some of our inpatient volumes. So we're, last year we were up uh, for acute days and discharges. We are significantly down this year. And uh, Joe will talk a little bit about some of our referral patterns and, and, and uh, uh, folks we get from Dartmouth. Uh, and then we have uh, account, uh, acute rehab discharges were up, but the patient days were down. And really, when we're looking about revenue, I only really care about the days. The clinical people care about the admissions and the discharges. I only look at the, at the days as the, as the staff because uh, I'm always trying to think what's the revenue per day. And, uh, so uh, we, our days were down despite the number of discharges up. Uh, swing discharges were down 20%, but swing days were up 7% uh, this year to date through February. And, and generally what we're seeing is a lower uh, acuity, for lack of a better word, for those types of patients, and as Joe has referenced, languishing uh, in that unit and not being able to get them out. Um, we do not get paid well, and we talked, we did a little primer on CAH finances a year or so ago here. Um, we're, we're getting a couple hundred bucks a day on those patients and we're probably uh, giving them $800 worth of services in true costs, so um, on direct costs. So that's, uh, that's very concerning. Um, so basically, if you look at the inpatient uh, um, as, a, as a total, uh, total discharges were down, days were up slightly, but the, the real takeaway from here is the area that did the best is the worst payer mix and the worst reimbursement. Uh, outpatient volumes, uh, ER is right on, uh, I think it's within actually one visit of uh, what we had budgeted. Uh, ancillaries are, are still doing good, and that's you know radiology and uh, laboratory predominantly. Our therapies, which were very busy last year, are slightly ahead of budget and the OR is uh, operating 5% uh, below, which is what we did last year. Uh, provider visits, um, again, uh, the hospital-based docs, the hospitalists and uh, uh, the anesthesiologists and those types, and the specialists, mostly surgeons, uh, they were all performing fairly well. Uh, they are ahead of budget through February, but uh, you can see all three areas of our primary care as we work through that transitioning process are still lagging uh, budget volumes. Yeah, just to add that, um, you know, we set a pretty low bar for productivity in our primary care clinics. We made a conscious decision as we got a sense of fixed prospective payments coming down the track and the ACO coming down the track that we would move our primary care docs away from any productivity or RVU incentive whatsoever. So we have a, uh, we have a flat salary uh, for folks. Uh, but still have um, limited access. So my, my, I would say that our, our primary care workforce has been a significant driver here. Um, I think folks would, uh, would love to see more patients, um, we have, but we have structurally changed um, uh, how we built out our clinics over, over time. But again, trying to see what, 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 what's, what it's going to look like two or three years down the road as opposed to what it looks like now. So um, 
that has been uh, a challenge, an ongoing challenge in primary care. I think we're getting close, though, uh, to getting into the promised land. Um, on the inpatient referral side, I, I said this at, at prior hearings, uh, we get around 500 post-acute patients from Dartmouth Patient Health every year. These are what we call swing patients, not necessarily the patients that go to our 10-bed acute rehab unit, but the folks that are just not quite ready for prime time after they're discharged from the hospital. Um, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock has um, struggled at times internally with its care management and with the referrals process. The way we move patients around the larger health system can sometimes be rather clumsy. Um, I uh, was away on a, a vacation in February and I was getting emails, uh, one from our referrals office saying, we only have three people waiting <coughs> that are on a list to come from Dartmouth today. And, and moments later, I'd get an email from Dartmouth Hitchcock saying, you tried to transfer two people to our ICU last night, but we couldn't take them because we had no beds. And then two minutes after that, another email from DH saying, why aren't you taking any of our patients? I said, well, you're, you're not pushing any to us. We're trying to pull, and you're not pushing. So our referrals for some reason in February, which was kind of the big smoking crater here for 19, um, dropped 30% in one month while DH was burgeoning with patients, literally bursting at the scenes with patients, much like the struggles UVM is going through now. Um, so this is an ongoing process. Um, I used to, I was the medical director of care management at Dartmouth Hitchcock before I went down to Mount Scutney. It's been something that we've been working on for 15 years, um, and something we still have uh, to keep the focus on. Because um, again, without, as I mentioned earlier, without that orthopedic surgeon making hay, I have got nothing to fill in the gaps if we're not full of all those DH patients getting our rehab services. And I think February bore that out. So as, as you see on this slide, we've got referrals from the DHH significantly down. And, and February was the deciding month in our first five months, clearly. Um, what we experienced last year in 18 was uh, more inpatient surgeries than we had anticipated or than we'd ever had historically in any year. And uh, we did not uh, uh, budget um, at FY18 levels. Um, we budgeted at more historical levels. And this year, we're actually having fewer inpatient surgeries. Um, and, and it just speaks to the small end we have. Um, you know, we're talking about two inpatient surgeries, uh, and that two becomes six. That's, a, that's we're euphoric, or the CFO's euphoric over that. Uh, but, you know, to go from two to one uh, is a 50% reduction. So um, th that's really one of the things we're up against here. Uh, again, the operating room was uh, not performing well. Uh, it's not that there's anything wrong with it. Uh, we had providers on vacation uh, and throughout the system uh, in February. And uh, we've got, uh, um, uh, you know, the, ref spring, uh, the swing referrals were coming in, but they were really leftovers from January uh, and February. So at, at the end of the day, the gross patient revenue was up 1.65%, which on paper sounds good. Um, there we go. Uh, but that being said, we get into some of the deductions from revenue. And uh, the payer mix was close to budget levels, was off a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, favorable or, uh, for the government payers, not so favorable for us. Um, but uh, one of the things we're bumping into this year is the ACO reserves. And when we uh, filed our budget with you folks last uh, July, uh, we had not received uh, adequate modeling information uh, for us to consider the other two programs. In fact, uh, we've just recently gotten our uh, attribution numbers. So we really don't even have our head around where we should be on that yet. Working on that currently, and so we are reserving for all three programs somewhat blindly at this point. So, if I were to err on any side of anything, as a CFO, it would be on the conservative side, so that uh, it's easier to uh, loosen the belt during the course of the year than to try to cinch it up three notches in September. So, uh, so we're taking a little, uh, a little bit of liberty, for lack of a better word, uh, with our reserves in that regard. We also received some duplicate payments uh, in our ACO activity, so we had to reserve against those. 
And then we also have built a, a reserve for Springfield Hospital and some of our receivables that are patient and non-patient. And so we've had a reserve for those as well. And so that has really skewed our, our deductions. Can you expand on that a little bit more? I'm not sure I understand that. So we, uh, Springfield is a self-funded health insurance plan. And if they are not sending money to the third party administrator, the third party administrator is not paying the facilities who have rendered care to their employees and dependents, which so are next door. We, so we were told back in January that they had indeed caught themselves up to date with Blue Cross, which was the TPA. And are you still seeing the lag in payments? Uh, we have a reserve of about ninety thousand uh, dollars for those patients that were, and that's over thirty days old. And then we had another ten thousand dollars in reserve for medical services we provided to their patients, like their CT was down, so they brought somebody up for a CT at our shop. We bill in Springfield. Springfield bills the insurer. So we had about ten thousand dollars. In receivables for that. Just a quick question on this to clarify. I'm reserving for all three programs, I guess how much was in the budget and if it was zero, that's fine, but how much are you booking? So when we look at if you're off by 1.7% year to date, I mean, how significant is that? It's really not that significant because we really only had two months of the other two payers that we hadn't contracted or didn't have modeling information. So our reserves for Medicaid are essentially the same uh, because our risk went up 100,000 a year on that. So the Medicaid last year is, looks a lot like the Medicaid this year, um, but uh, for the commercial and the Medicare, we have some small placeholders within our reserves and the exact amount is uh, Medicaid, they're both less than Medicaid and probably by themselves are somewhat material. Uh, they're probably a hundred thousand, the two of them, somewhere around there. And then on the duplicate payment reserve, since you weren't supposed to get it, I guess if you booked it, that should be a you know a wash, basically, unless it's crossing years. Um, so if you got paid a hundred thousand, you weren't supposed to get it. You're reserving for the hundred thousand. Number, I mean, it's not going to have an impact. But. Yeah, in, in theory, absolutely. But I'm just saying that that you've got cash, and the offset is the contractual allowance. So we have both, and so we we book the reserve to cancel them out. To your point, but that's when we look down our reserve, our third party reserves that run through contractual allowances. That's a bucket in there. So the. Uh, The big concern, my big concern actually, is that we are kind of, we are woefully under-reserved for what our potential downside risk is. Um, and, you know, I put on my one care hat, I'm the vice chair of the one care board of managers, a believer in, in the program, but it has been a challenge, mostly because of CMS not releasing good modeling data, for us to get a, a real firm number on what our downside risk is for, for Medicare especially, and that's the biggest, the biggest pot there. Um, initial modeling had total downside risk for Medicare, Medicaid, and commercials of around 600,000. That was the number we used to, I used to cajole and convince my board that we needed to go into all three programs for 19. Late, uh, the latest modeling shows a downside risk of 1.6 million dollars. So um, that's a number I wouldn't have even taken to my board because we, uh, unless I had a, uh, a wink, wink, nod from from Dartmouth saying that they would backstop our, our risk because that's just too much for a hospital like us to bear. I mean, that's, that's two years of margin uh, uh, that we could be sending off. So we, we've done a lot to mitigate that downside risk. There's extra population health payments that we get and um, to, to probably cut that in half, but it's still a, it, it still is a big number for a small hospital. Um, so you know, moving through the rest of this year, we're, we're gonna have to be a little bit more aggressive. And so there, you know, there, any one of these issues by themselves is not uh, super critical to our February results, but they are all contributors. Um, kind of trying to move this along here. Um, other operating revenues on budget when we move the FPP money. Um, the expenses, I, again, uh, 
FTEs are down, just like they were last year. And the difference is that this year the salaries are up. And we've listed um, a couple reasons why that is occurring. Uh, number one, we spread our budget by historical utilization by month. And so um, we spread it a little bit light on the front end and a little bit heavier on the back end than we intended to. So we're having an unfavorable variance for, for salaries. But even for March, we've looked at March and it's starting to, it's, it's kind of coming back into line again. So I'm not overly concerned about that, but it is a contributor through February. Um, we have a, a bulk of hold up here called Companion Age Sitter. And uh, we have some folks who uh, stay on our floor who, who need some oversight uh, that the nurses can't just sit there and, and, and be with them. It's a safety issue. Uh, and so we have uh, these two types of uh, uh, folks that sit in with the patients and keep an eye on them and alert the nursing if there's any problems. And uh, we've had difficulty hiring uh, for those jobs, so now we have more expensive employees filling those roles. Uh, and then uh, we also had a, uh, um, a bonus that came out through the uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock system. That was about 100000 to us. Uh, they hit our books and is a budgeted be a one-time hit, so it'll soften up as the year goes on. And relative to purchase labor, that's up 11%, and uh, really, again, that's pre predominantly driven by uh, travelers and locums and some contracted staff that were uh, recently hired, so. Uh, benefits this year, we've had a really uh, good run for a number of years on our benefits costs, and we have come in under budget benefits year in, year out for at least three years. Um, we did not change our plan, um, but we are having um, a, a lot more folks uh, tapping into their benefits uh, early in the year. And so that was a, a key contributor of a few hundred thousand dollars unfavorable year to date. Uh, supplies are up, uh, mostly in the area of infusion and chemo. Uh, depreciation is running over budget. We're actually on pace, we're actually a little bit early on some of our capital purchasing this year. Usually, you kind of start off really slow and it builds steam as the year goes on. Uh, this year, we actually get the ground running and uh, we're actually in front of this, so we're running a little ahead in uh, depreciation. Um, all other expenses are running, and those are all things that we generally control, we're all running uh, under budget expectation. So our operating margin, as we mentioned earlier, is negative 340000 or $700,000 off the budget. And uh, relative to total margin, which we have very little control over, um, we have, uh, uh, we're at 138 versus a budget of 283. And so we're down uh, 144K from uh, budget year to date. For your enjoyment, I have a PNL for you. And uh, so kind of looking at the prior year, uh, which I thought was an interesting question. I, I haven't really processed through whether I like it or not. Um, so uh, FY19 versus 18, so all these bullet points uh, refer to how 19 is compared to 18. So inpatient is, is clearly uh, performing worse, uh, $425,000 in gross revenue uh, short. Outpatient is actually performing really well and ahead of last year. Uh, acute rehab is behind by 40,000. Swing is a little bit better, but again, worst payer mix ever. Uh, provider revenues are actually uh, slightly up. And now, out of all of those revenue discussions, you have to remember there's a, there's a price increase in there. And we're not talking about net revenue, we're talking about a price increase that you folks approved that we have put in. So you have to mitigate all of those numbers uh, and then deductions are, are up 7.4% uh, from last year, and uh, net patient revenues up 1%, so total net revenues up 2.7%. So we are ahead of last year on the top half of the P&L, uh, but some of that is uh, vapor because it's a gross price increase in there. Looking at expenses, uh, the most concerning on this list is, is salaries, and we've pulled that apart for the last two finance committee meetings uh, internally, and uh, you know, we think we can mitigate it, um, and we think part of it's uh, associated with the spread of uh, expense over the course of the year, um, so it probably will not stay at that number uh, for the remainder of the year. 
Uh, purchase labor is up, as we mentioned. Benefits is running hot compared to last year. Uh, purchase services are up. Supplies are up, uh, mostly because of volume. Uh, and all of the other expenses are actually running uh, two to three and a half percent below uh, where they were last year. Uh, depreciation is up because we're on our capital programs earlier. We're about 700,000 behind last year's performance, just like we are against budget. And uh, total margin is running about $1.2 million uh, behind last year. And that was really because last year we had some excellent uh, investment market returns. So uh, we asked for projection. Um, so early in the year, I tend not to try to trend everything, especially where fe uh, February was just by itself, just such a bad month. The, the, the first four months were not great, but they weren't horrible. Uh, but uh, February really just cratered uh, the year to date. And so um, I really didn't want to trend that. I didn't feel comfortable with that. So we took actual results for five months and budget for the uh, remaining seven. And uh, really, when we look at that, uh, you know, we've gone over some senior leadership discussions about um, expenses and, and revenues and you know how likely is this to continue for the remainder of the year and we feel like uh, we can definitely mitigate if not change uh, the results the next seven months um, our, our gross patient revenue trend will uh, not make up uh, for the early shortcoming so uh, you know we don't have a secret service that we've been waiting to unleash on the planet uh, to generate a lot of revenue so it really is going to happen at the expense side uh, and uh, really uh, spending some time analyzing our deductions. Uh, NPR will stay the same or, or get slightly worse uh, as a percentage based on our ACO activity and our reserves. And um, those are really kind of the big drivers to how we look forward on the top half of the P&L. Uh, other operating revenue will be on the same track. Again, no, we have no tricks up our sleeve on that, so it's probably just going to continue the way it's gone, and it's gone fairly well. Um, we're going to keep managing FTEs uh, relative to expenses. Uh, we have a market salary uh, increase scheduled and budgeted for July, and uh, that is clearly at risk at this point. Uh, we've made a lot of ground on the market. I don't think we're market commensurate yet, but we're in the hunt, and uh, we, we may not be able to do that. And then we're going to look at addressing these companion aids and patient centers. The percentage of patients that we have coming in the door that require this 24-hour oversight is actually a very large percentage of who we have on that surge, specifically in the swim bed area. So these are just people who are just there around the clock, essentially for a handful of patients. And it adds up, even though they're not super highly paid, uh, it does add up. Uh, purchase labor, we've made a couple moves uh, with recruiting uh, to uh, reduce some travelers. We've seen a big drop off in uh, February and March especially on traveler and locums costs. So we're just gonna continue with those plans that we put in place earlier in the year and hopefully uh, uh, that will continue. Uh, benefits, um, we don't have a lot of control over that. And, uh, uh, but uh, we've had a really good run for three years, so I'm hoping this is just kind of an anomaly, the first couple calendar years or uh, months of the year, and uh, that they will slow back down again. And the rest of the expenses will, will probably not change markedly better or worse uh, for the remainder of, this, of the fiscal year. So we're actually, uh, earlier this week, we worked on it and revised our, our projection. Um, and this is, I think, conservative. Uh, I hate putting negative numbers up anywhere, um, but we have a, we're projecting a, a negative margin of 679,000 on operations, uh, and I'm fairly confident we're going to do better than that, but that relies on uh, the 300 some odd people that we have the organizational pitching in. What are we going to do? We have to manage FTEs. Uh, we've talked about in our prior uh, presentations here that Every FTE goes before a committee to be determined whether we're actually going to hire that or, or not. And uh, that has never stopped and will continue. Um, we're working aggressively on the referral processes with Dartmouth. Uh, we're coming up with some uh, creative solutions for recruiting and retention. 
talk about one now just to give you an idea of kind of how we're looking at things. So we had a lot of retention issues with respiratory therapy. Uh, call is a huge dissatisfier. Uh, a lot of hospitals are, uh, and again, I'm talking about smaller hospitals, larger hospitals who are running ICUs and special care units have uh, respiratory therapy three shifts. Smaller hospitals historically don't, most of us. So we, uh, uh, when that department started reporting to me, we looked at it and said, what are we doing wrong with the recruiting? What are we doing wrong with retention? And as we went through all of that, um, I ended up uh, deciding, well, you know what? We actually don't need to throw money at this on a per person level. What, what people are telling us is it's not the pay, it's the call responsibility and uh, the, the changing schedules. So we just need to lock in the schedule. Uh, and so we went three shifts for respiratory therapy. And uh, when we looked at the revenue and expense, pluses and minuses, by giving employees greater satisfaction, not touching the pay rates, uh, we were very easily able to recruit the third shift staff, uh, allow our manager to actually manage the department more of the time, because if most hospitals, small hospitals are working managers. And, oh, by the way, we were able to take sicker patients from our community that Dartmouth couldn't get out because we didn't have the ability to provide respiratory therapy three shifts, seven days a week. And so we're, we're looking at a net of about $250,000 uh, on the bottom line. Uh, we went live with that, uh, coincidentally, in February. And uh, we estimated we need to take in about 12 patients a year to make that happen and worthwhile. And so still really early yet, a month into it, essentially, uh, we had three patients that came in the first month. So uh, we're confident that that is going to, uh, A, get rid of all of our travelers and respiratory therapy, uh, and B, put a little money on the bottom line and do a better job for our community. Uh, uh, we're gonna have a small gain on meaningful use, not like last year. Uh, again, we're, gonna, we're working currently on completing the analysis of modeling for ACO, potential risks uh, for Mount Scotty specifically. And then uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I was here for the Gifford presentation and saw their list of uh, four and a half billion things that they're going to do to save money. And having generated those lists in my past, uh, I immediately cringed uh, because it's a lot of reporting back to people, uh, more so than the work itself. And uh, so we've, we've got our list of our own going, and, uh, and we'll be managing through that over the coming months, and we would be happy to uh, provide updates as requested or needed. My last thing here is a reminder of our uh, operating income over the last 18 years. So uh, the blue line is the budget, and the uh, orangey line is the uh, actual performance, and so, um, I started here, so we've kind of stopped, you know, we've kind of stopped, gone flat, and we've had a big uh, multi-year uh, succession of losses, and this is a cumulative margin calculator. And uh, so we've kind of flattened out, and we've, the last three years we've been in the black, but we haven't made up for the losses in the prior years. Um, if you like our graphs, uh, a slightly different uh, look at this as our performance, Action is orange and our uh, uh, budget is blue, and so uh, we're definitely the bars are on the right side of the, the zero line for the last few years, and uh, we hope to keep keep that going. So, Dave, a couple of things. Uh, it seems to be a, a swing in the employee benefits last year. Uh, being a down year on employee benefits, but this current year that you're in, uh, following through that, um, is any of that related to reporting or? I'm sorry, related to? Well, you had um, in year 18, it looked like um, your employee benefits came under budget, mm -hmm. and in 19, you're, you're way above budget. And I'm just curious if any of that came in that can be kind of in the reporting cycle so that, um, or is it just totally different things that we're making those uh, variances in each year? No, it's just actual experience. So uh, we, we don't, uh, there's not much of an accrual associated with the benefit line item. So uh, 
pretty much whatever happened in, in January is what happened in January. And it's the books accordingly. Uh, we reserve uh, for um, our lag, our run out, which is basically 17 days currently uh, through the process. But if uh, our fiscal year ended in September, so uh, if you think about your benefits, your deductible and out of pockets are probably met as you get closer to the end of the calendar year. So our first three months of this year were actually last calendar year's uh, program policy. And so October, November, December are usually a higher utilization because folks, their out of pockets have been met. Uh, and then this year, January, February, we just, we just had a lot of claims. You, you came to us a couple months ago with uh, some pretty good optimism about the uh, comparative effective research program that you were putting in place. Um, do you have any early results? So, um, uh, boy, we're under oath, right? Yep. So, um, <laughs> so I am I am I'm underwhelmed uh, by the speed of uh, implementation of that program in a very large system. So. Um, so we're, it, it's, as I like to say, a herd of turtles. And I'm not talking about the little turtles scampering down to the ocean. We're talking about the, the giant ones that seemingly don't move. So, um, uh, so I'm pushing uh, on that, and I'm being completely inappropriate right now for my personal career. Um, but I am pushing very hard at the system level for faster adoption. And um, I think they, they, all the good intentions, but when they started rolling it out, just the complexity of, of, of 12 facilities converting onto this. So we've seen something, uh, and it's in line with what I had uh, hoped for, but it is really slow. Okay. And then um, you had a slight up in uh, other revenue from uh, CLO services. What was that? Uh, we contract some of our own staff out here and there. Uh, that's that's uh, a large portion of that. Uh, so uh, we have a... Yeah, we, we rent out our speech therapist, for example. Uh, we don't have really full-time work for her, so when we have an opportunity to rent out for a vacation, we make her a traveler, uh, and, and that's generally what's in there. Some catering, stuff like that, but generally staff rental. And, and what you consider one of the risks is the uh, reserves for Springfield. I'm just curious, um, not that anybody should uh, find any positive in somebody else's pain. But have you seen any uptick in either um, patients or job applicants based on what's happening at the nearby hospital? Uh, so yes on both. Not, um, not an exodus, but I think a steady drip, um, whether it be nursing, administrative uh, help. Uh, we, knowing that there inpatient capacity is limited right now because of some of their nursing losses. I, I've, I've reached out to their emergency uh, medicine folks and said, we have some inpatient capacity. If you can't take these folks, don't call DH. They're, they're burgeoning. They, don't, they, can't, they can't handle them either. So we are now, you know, our other um, local partner hospitals are under some stress uh, too. You know, we, we all are in the same community. Um, so we have we have pretty robust physician staffing on the inpatient side of the hospital. So we, we, we take patients from the Springfield ED, from the Valley Regional ED uh, regularly. Um, the other new wrinkle in our regional healthcare issue is uh, a new staffing model that is starting in Springfield this week in their emergency room. So they're a very busy ED, 16, 17,000 visits a year. Um, and uh, they've got a new staffing model. I think it's unclear what that'll mean for the rest of us. Um, my guess is uh, I have concerns that that staff model might not be able to handle that volume of visits, so it's going to be um, going to need more folks in our emergency room and probably more folks heading up to the DH, which they, like UVM, really don't have the capacity for right now. What is happening with the docs that chose not to uh, consider going to a different employer? So uh, really just, it was really just one doctor. It was all the PAs, uh, the physician's assistants. Um, you know, we worked hard to try to find a home for them within the DH system, but you know, as Dave talked about herding turtles, all the members of that system can sometimes be uh, difficult to wrangle as well. And they weren't 
ready to go to a PA staff model in their small emergency rooms. Um, so unfortunately, I think we're going to lose some of that workforce out of, out of Vermont, which we can't afford, which we simply, I agree, cannot, um, cannot afford. Um, uh, a lot of effort went into trying to salvage it. Um, and, and frankly, we could be in that position later in the summer if, because we are still contracted with that PA group through this fiscal year. If they were to come apart, I have assurances that they, that they won't, um, but we could be looking at plan B and what, what we're going to do to staff RED by the end of the summer if, if we can't turn things around. Okay. Questions from the board? Right. Uh, yeah, I just had, wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship with Dartmouth Hitchcock and, um, you know, I think it's obviously a beneficial thing for the hospital, but how should we think about it when you originally were supposed to get a contribution from them for 18, so I'm looking really more at 18 and 18 performance. And you know, you came in higher, right, top line. You um, had some swing beds, stuff that went on, and a lot of that you don't make as much money on, and I think comes from Dartmouth Hitchcock. So just really, what's, what do we think, and, and I guess the other part of that would be, are you getting influx from New Hampshire residents into the state, and maybe that you know was driving some of the top line number that you had? So but with all that, it's really you know I think the, the relationship with Dartmouth is great. But when we're looking just at you know Vermont and the Vermont performance, and whether or not we're subsidizing you know Dartmouth through that process. Um, or not, do you know what I mean? So it's just because they were going to give us money and they didn't because you made more in total, but if we kind of isolate it out, you know, should there be a contribution from Dartmouth in there, um, and how does that play out? So uh, I think there are a lot of layers um, in, that, in that question. And, uh, I've said this before too, when DH sneezes, we get, we get a cold, right? So we'll lose services or gain services depending on, on how DH is, is doing. Um, but generally, you're right, it has been beneficial for us. We um, have always been a believer that a, a full hospital beds, even in an ACL world, full hospital beds allow you to regularize your staffing, to have predictable revenue. Um, and our relationship with DH generally allows us, except for February, to, to keep our hospital full and keep our, 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 our staffing where, where it should be. Um, but they, uh, you know, they set a on the system level. They set a margin target for for every member in the hospital, and it's our job to uh, to, to reach that. Um, we uh, and, and we work very hard in a challenging environment to get to what their mar what they would like the margin target to be. So we have to balance that with you know our our. You know our, our growth targets through the through the Green Care Board as well, so it's it's a real balancing act. I don't know a, another way to put it more eloquently, um, but you know my concern every budget season, as it is with Dave, is does the margin target that we get from the system are we able to get there with um, you know without hay making surgical specialists. You know, we can't primary care our way out of these, out of these uh, issues. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't think Vermont is subsidizing DH. I think, I don't think we would be in one care if, if, if I wasn't part of a larger system. In fact, I've, I'm quite certain that 19 would be my last year because we just can't. You know, if one month throws us behind the budget that much, you know, six tough months. Um, in, in the setting of potential downside risk, when all of our most expensive care does not happen for our HSA, it doesn't happen in winter. All our expensive care happens at DH or Bay State Medical Center when DH is full or UVM if patients go that way. Um, it's just too much for a little place um, uh, to manage. But because I'm part of a larger system, and you know, DH and UVM are the founders, and, and uh, Again, we think it's the right thing to do. If I didn't have DHs um, uh, backstopping, then it would be really tough to engage in an alternative payment model. 
Did I answer the question? I mean, I, it's yeah, it's a tough, tough one to answer. Yeah, yeah. And catch me on a different day. I'll say something uh, different depending on what the stressors are for that given day. Dave. No, I think you did. I, I wanted, yeah. you know, I wanted to get your perspective on if you think, right, Lamadas are subsidizing, you know, dark in this situation <laughs> because you know we're taking maybe swing beds and things like that. So I, I think that's a very good point and. When we, in some of the uh, earlier uh, few years back, when we did have a sub, we, we always struggled with what to call it. Is it a subsidy? Is it, uh, is it a system allocation payment? There was no good name for it and really terrible accounting for it. Um, so, you know, we determined that our swing bed volume is probably going to be, it's probably really about a, a million dollars worth of value. And I think we kind of settled on that for a couple of years. We never codified it into a contract or anything else. But 500 swing patients a year or 1,500 patient days of, of borders, it, it's, it's probably worth around a million bucks. And that was about what the system allocation payment or subsidy was um, at that time. Now we've, again, because of our expense reduction and expense management over the years, we were, I think, able to, to keep that at around a million dollars. And then after a few things broke our way from volume, like last in, in 18, then we actually you know, turned the corner from an operating margin. But part of my fear is that we are returning to more historical uh, norms on, uh, on volume. And uh, you know, we may be bringing that Bell at DH again saying, okay, we're still taking all of these swing patients, and a good chunk of those borders were folks that started their journey at DH and, and ended up with us after complex care uh, up there. So, um, you know, at the end of the, the day, DH, the DHH, the system, is wants us to succeed. They would like us to float, uh, you know, our own uh, bottom line, but um, you know, it's, it, it can be a challenge. I guess that's the thing, just as a consideration consideration because if you on average were getting about a million dollars and now we're doing a lot better because of expense management and things like that, but you do it you're you're sitting as a standalone, you need to make certain margins that you support, you know, partially by rate increase and things like that. And if you were to get that million dollars from Dartmouth, you wouldn't need to press that button as hard. So it's I don't know what the right answer is, but we, we don't either. <laughs> I mean, we just, you know, we just did a, a part of our approval process last year was documenting the increase of New Hampshire business within our four walls. Um, that has continued uh, through at least through January was the last time we looked at it. And, and when we look at things like the respiratory therapy program, we just, you know, enhanced for lack of a better word. Um, you know, we are going to see some New Hampshire business for that. Uh, they're not only New Hampshire patients, but they're, they're, they're patients that were generating bills in New Hampshire uh, that will now be generating bills in, in Vermont. And so, you know, I, it is kind of hard to track all of that because we do get jammed with New Hampshire people in the swing bed unit that are not very lucrative and hard to discharge. Um, so we have to pay that price. But I think if Dartmouth were sitting here today, and I would never speak for them, uh, the finance, uh, the CFO, Dan Jansen, would re you know, remind the group you know, that, hey, we're working with you on, uh, on, on terminating uh, you know, this pension, and uh, you would never be able to get the funding for that any other way. And that is going to save the system $1.3 million, which would be entirely accurate and true. So. We have a we have a pro and con list going all the time and trying to weigh it. Other questions? Tom. Um, so I went back and, and kind of looked, and looked at the um, budget that was presented for the 2019 budget, and I was looking at the payer mix, and there's uh, quite a um, and. I noticed in the presentation here, I think it's on page 17, it says payer mix close to budgeted levels. Um, and I so went back to uh, the submit the um, 2019 budget documents and uh, looked at the 2018 projected versus the 2019 proposed. And it had Medicaid dropping significantly as a proportion from 
uh, almost by 55% uh, year over year, and Medicare going up in terms of the dollar value um, by 12 <coughs> because it's a much bigger base. Um, it, it basically balanced out uh, the Medicaid reduction. And um, if maybe you told me at one point or told the board at one point in time you know, why that dramatic change in projections for Medicaid and Medicare, um, and and assuming that's you know where, where you said that the payer mix seems to be as projected, um, is uh, is it unfolding in in those kind of proportions? So our uh, our budget for FY19 was kind of a hybrid relative to payer mix between what we were experiencing in FY18 and what historically we had seen. So um, Medicaid, for example, we had seen a steady increase as a percentage for many years, 10 to 12 to 14 to 15 to 16, you know, and, and bumping around that 14 to 16 range. Uh, and then uh, we saw an improvement last year. And those folks actually, uh, you know, those people, not so much, but that money ended up in, in the Medicare bucket as a percentage. And, and Medicare pays uh, more than Medicaid. And so we budgeted this year somewhere between the high and the low of our expectations last year and what we actually lived with. So we kind of budgeted in the middle of that and that's kind of where we're running right now. Within, I think Medicaid's within a half a percentage point. It's up a half a percentage point and Medicare's up a bit and commercial and Blue Cross are down a little bit, but it's five months of the year and it's pretty close. So Medicaid is up by half a percentage point relative to 2018? No, rel relative to our budget for 19, which was somewhere between actual budget of, of 18. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Other questions? Jess? Um, well, so first of all, thank you. Uh, it's always important for us to hear the story of what's happening in the hospitals, and it's always interesting, and your humor is always welcome. Yes, well, the fact that <laughs> I still have a job after yeah. several of these is somewhat amazing. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, so I, under, I, well, I have a clarifying question. I know how important primary care is to you and your community and how you've always been a you know, uh, proponent of building more primary care in your community in comparison. I'm a little bit confused about what's happening with primary care. So my understanding is the volumes are down, but you still have access issues. So is that a productivity issue? Is it a some providers left and now you're replacing them? I'm just trying to understand yeah. the volumes are down, but access issues are up. Yeah. Our, um so it is a little bit of a productivity issue, and I have, sometimes have to remind our physician staff, our provider staff in the clinic that um, all, even though I'm uh, ringing the bell on our attributed lives all the time, attributed lives, our attributions, probably around 6,000 patients in total amongst the three programs, and we've got somewhere between 14, probably around 14,000 primary care population split amongst our two primary care clinics. So there is a, there's a lot of patients that aren't in risk programs. Um, they're either in commercial programs in Vermont or the entire New Hampshire population, which again is 25 to 28 percent of our primary care base. So I still need the docs to be productive. Um, um, and we've probably swung the pendulum toward non productivity a little too much, I'm trying to step that back a little bit. Um, but we, we were down. Um, Probably four FTE in our physician staff in the clinics um, for the last few years. Steadily would hire someone, whether it would be a good hire, or they didn't like it, whatever it was. Um, and it's only recently that we've just gotten some momentum. And where our access, we, we have the wrong kind of access. If, if, if you have a sore throat or you hurt your back, we can see you that day or the next day. If you want to see more provider, if you want to, what we lack is paneled primary care providers. Um, we have basically shut off the valve and have a 100 plus patient waiting list right now to get into, uh, to have a, a, a physician of record and attending physician. Uh, that said, we're starting to use some of the wrong kind of access, that same day access, to tee up these folks on the waiting list for our new providers, which are coming first of June, middle of July, end of September, um, just to get them in the door. And frankly, we certainly do need the volume and we need revenue. Our issue in clinic has been the wrong kind of access. And when a bunch of folks retire who've been in practice a long time, that's what happens. You end up with a, a number of PAs and NPs who can do the same day work 
but they're not going to manage your diabetes over the long term. They're, they're there for urgency. So I think we're finally getting getting ahead of that. Yeah, and then, and then you know, the struggle with all new providers. And I was myself when I went up to DH almost 19 years ago. I took over the practice of a long time doc at DH, and every patient was new to me for a year and a half, and that that is. Rule. So it, it's hard when a bunch of people leave and you try to rebuild your practices. I know that other folks in the audience are looking at Steve Gordon, and you've got a bunch of people leave the clinics. It takes a long time to recover. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. and it sounds like you're on the right track. It's yeah. a temporary. Um, the other question I have, and this relates to the small end problem that you refer to, um, I think as I start thinking, this is something I've been thinking about a lot more in the last year, but as we move towards not only, you know, in a cost containment era, but we're in a quality accountability era. And I think a lot now about the choices of scope of services at hospitals, as you may hear and hear me talk about. And so the red flag went off when I heard um, one to two surgeries a month. So those, yeah, are, those are inpatient. So if someone that comes in, not, not scheduled surgeries, but folks that come in through the ED, okay. transfers from another hospital. Okay. Yeah, there's more. And, and I was saying, okay. my question yeah. was, well, I guess I'm still going to ask the question, but I'm glad to yeah. hear that that's yeah. not what I thought it was when I first heard it. In so. fact, uh, those were almost all done by our, our general surgeons, okay. our general surgery practice. And out of, you know, we were going, we kicked off budget this week. Uh, and Mount Scotty, and we went through all of the clinic volumes. It's like ah, general surgery. I don't have to worry about them. They're they're doing their job. You know, they're they're seeing the patients. They're generating the revenue. They're managing their expenses. They're doing all the right things. So, uh, those were general surgeries that we either inherited from another organization or came in through the ED. We just don't typically do that scope of service, and a lot of the general surgeries are typically outpatient. Okay. So. But let me, so it's still, I'm glad to hear that, that's clarifying, and thank you. But I, I do want to know, how do you choose, you know, the scope of services that you're going to offer, and how do, we, how do you know, how do you decide that the volume is enough to achieve the efficiency and the economies of scale that's going to reduce the cost of care, and the volume is enough to ensure that the quality of care is going to be yep. at a high level? How those do you are, do those that, are great questions, and I, I knew where you were angling, uh, <laughs> angling toward, um, and it makes sense. So. Another benefit of being part of the system is we, we're part of system credentialing as well. So, um, and that work is is growing in the sense that as we credential new providers at the system level, A, we want the credential that all, that all of the system members so that we can move parts around the system. If our general surgeon's on vacation, we need someone to do a gallbladder or an appendectomy, we have the ability to move that people over. But the more complex cases, especially surgical cases and surgical oncology cases, that each the providers have to have a minimum number of cases or, they, or the system will not credential them for that work. So we fall right into that as well. Our general surgeries uh, are what are called missing fundoplications. We're wrapping the esophagus to help deal with reflux, appendectomies, lumpectomies for uh, breast masses, uh, gallbladders. It, these are all um, outpatient surgeries. Every once in a while we get a bowel obstruction that we have to do. Keep in mind that our uh, half of our general surgery, actually 60% of our general surgery coverage is in Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, community general surgeon who spends time at both places where volumes are, is volumes so some of it's volume in total, some of it's exactly. Dartmouth Hitchcock, some of it's at Dartmouth Exactly. Wait, oh, sorry, I, I, I just wanted to just can, can you repeat your, oh, I just said so volume in total. Exactly, and we track, high enough and we track all places. of that. And the other part of our general surgeon, uh, surgery coverage uh, does cases with us and as well at, at the London Hospital in New Hampshire. So we, again, just to go back, that, that's a real benefit of, of, of the system. If they said, I want to start doing surgical oncology cases, or, or a surgeon came to us and said, we want to do that at your place, we would say no. Okay. Dave, would cry. Dave would cry, but I would say no. <laughs> or if you wanted to do one to sur two surgeries a month, you would probably say no. Just oh. in general, that number was correct. <laughs> okay, yes. thank you. Probably questions from the board. If not, at this time, I'll open it up to public comment. Seeing none, we want to thank you for coming up and uh, sharing the story at Mount Scott. All right, let's hope February was just a, a blip on the radar. I'm up, please. Thank you. Thank you.
faculty at North Country, who's the next hospital that you're hearing from. Um, this is the information that, again, we've asked the hospitals to respond to, and we're providing it for you here. This slide shows the net patient revenue, FPP, for FY18 and FY19, as submitted by the hospital and as approved. Um, in FY18, the hospital asked for and was approved a minus 2.6% increase over their FY17 budget. Um, there was an adjustment made for addition there, so you see the numbers are not exactly the same. Um, in FY19, the hospital asked for and was approved for a 3.1% increase over their FY18 budget. In terms of charge, again, um, they asked for and were approved in FY18 a 5.0% increase in their charge. And in FY19, they asked for and were approved a 3.6% increase in their charge over FY18. I just want to point out, um, and we've mentioned this when we're doing our FY18 year and result analysis, that North Country's data is still considered preliminary. Um, and some of the, the data that we have is through email, is through the adaptive system, and is through verbal conversations with the staff at the hospital. So just want to point that out to you. Um, so for example, if you picked up the FY18 year and report right now, the information would not match what you're seeing today. Um, their FY18 year end results on NPR, if you're looking at budget to actual, they came in minus 3.4% on NPR FPP, which is why they're here today. They were under 1.1% on operating expenses. Their operating margin, total margin, and days cash on hand are minus 2.3% on operating margin, 1.2% on total margin, and 196 days cash on hand. That same information, but looking at it from an actual to actual perspective, they're under on their NPR of minus 0.4%. Under on operating expenses, minus, minus, minus 1.0%. Operating margin, the change from FY17 to FY18 is, is zero points, no change there. Their change on the total margin from FY18 compared to FY17 is minus 1.1, and they're up 11 days cash on hand. We asked the hospital to come in and tap up their year-to-date performance as of February 28th. So they are down on their NPR, FPP, minus 2.6 when looking at a budget, comparing their budget to actual. They're down minus 0 0.2 on operating expenses, and their operating margin is minus 2.3 as of February 28th, that's a point in time, minus 2.3%. Their total margin is minus 2.2%, and their days cash on hand is 183 days. If you're looking at the same information, but an actual to actual comparison of where they are February 28, 2019, compared to February 28, 2018, um, their NPR has increased 1.5%, their operating expenses has increased 5.7%, and their operating margin um, this time last year was 0.4%, total margin 4.5%, and days cash on hand. We did not request that information this time last year, and so we don't have that data. Um, the hospital submitted a FY19 projection with their F February 28th submission. They're projecting um, their NPR to come in at a little above 80 million, which will be a minus 1.7% variance from their budget to projection. Their operating expense is 86,441,332, which is slightly lower than their um, budget to projection, minus 0.2%. Their operating margin, their projecting is gonna be minus 0.3% from their budget. Their total margin, their projecting will be minus 1.4 points lower than their projection. And um, they were not able to provide us with a day's cash on hand projection. And these next two slides just show their five-year results um, for NPR, FTP operating expenses, operating margin, and total margin. So you can see the five-year cater is 1.6% um, with a budget for FY 2019 coming in at $81,523,350. On operating expenses, um, their five-year cater is 2.4%. And 
their operating margin. Um, you can see the five-year results there in their FY 2019 budget, similarly to total margin, um, their five-year results. So the last two years on operating margin, they have dipped into the negative, minus 2.3% the last two years in a row. And total margin has um, stayed above in the positive. So are there any questions on the data? Any questions for staff? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? July through September. So bad debt, um, that con what's contributed to the bad debt uh, incline, it's been a steady incline over the last several years. We do attribute some of that to high deductibles. And then also we had our integration into uh, our conversion to Athena Health for our information system. And so when you're going through those conversions, you're also anticipating um, that delay and delayed in billing. And in collections, so right now we're attributing our incline and bad debt to uh, those two key drivers. And then um, I arrived at the hospital in October, and uh, this was my welcoming present to USC, uh, decreasing utilization for the first quarter, last quarter of our, our year. And uh, so we, 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 hit, uh, we did not hit our marks for budget in emergency department inpatient admissions, inpatient respiratory care, and diagnostic imaging and laboratory. So all these, um, through low utilization, really deeply impacted the, uh, the net patient revenue for North Country Hospital. And this is a visual, and Andre will go through the visual detail of how that works. So these are the drivers for our, our margin performance at the end of 2018. Brian just said a uh, uh, big part of the net revenues uh, impact hit in the last quarter of the year last year. Um, <clears throat> as you walk through it, we also had an issue with 340B revenues last year. That is when um, Rite Aid was purchased by Walgreens. And that, was, that transaction occurred in January. We didn't start seeing any revenues until August. They did backdate some of those, but we feel that we did lose some of those. If we go a little bit to, further to the right under pharmacy drugs, we did have a favorable uh, expense variance on pharmacy drugs, which is uh, a relation to that 340B revenue piece. Um, we also had a decrease in some of our other revenues uh, across the board. We have a lot of uh, miscellaneous other revenues, and, and those I think were impacted by the slowdown uh, of some of our services over the summer. Implementation of the theme. <clears throat> so, we did have some expense uh, favorable variances. The benefits and the pharmacy drugs were the largest drivers for that. One other, one other um, um, point to make on this is in our maintenance agreement. You'll see that uh, we are starting to operationalize our Athena Health. And that previously has been a capitalized project, but um, that, that structure has been um, new to the, uh, the way we handle that in our income statement. And the hospital expects to save roughly one and a half million dollars in uh, annual operating costs with this new shared agreement. So what's, what's um, unique about Athena Health is they're tied into the hospital performance and success. So uh, the hospital utilization is good and collections are good. That's good for Athena because uh, they're a partner in that. Um, rather than um, a typical project is you just pay for, you pay for the software 
um, and those can be in the millions of dollars is that they're upgrades whether you need this or not and there's no and it's just whatever support you get on that so um, this is uh, a cloud-based product which is I would say um, a, a, a new line of work as far as you're seeing information systems starting to participate in the success of the hospital rather than just rolling out products in, in a cost environment. So um, when we look back to February or today, net patient revenues uh, compared to budget, you can see the blue, the blue represents our actual and uh, the red represents our budget and these are aggregates of year-to-date numbers for each column. So uh, when you look through November, December, January, February, you'll see those lines are very close um, to being on track. Contrast that to the start of FY19. Um, this is what it's looked like through this through the oh, sorry. There. Um, so for FY19, you'll see that there's a little gap there. So starting in October, we were right in line with our net patient revenue budget. And then November, December were our large gaps. Um, this possibly could be uh, the high deductible environment where um, patients may uh, access going, coming into the, to the year end, knowing they have uh, some Healthcare that they're going to anticipate, they could they could decide to start in that in January, February, and so we did see a pickup in utilization in January and February. And so when you look at year to date, uh, that gap has shrunk to roughly three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And then uh, we're just finishing up our March. March has been above budget, um, and uh, we believe this this gap will shrink or disappear. So here's what that looks like when we're looking at our operating margin for the hospital. Um, so as the utilization played out, you can see our gap and our bottom line uh, grew to the lowest point in December 31st of roughly $1.8 million operating loss. And uh, the black line represents what our budgeted operating margin was to be. So in January, we uh, worked hard with the team to roll out our budget mitigation plans, which represented about $2 million in uh, conceptual uh, revenue and operating expense uh, improvements. We, uh, we froze our capital budget, which is a three and a half million dollar spend. Um, and that's, that's an average spend every year, about three and a half million dollars. Um, so our FY19 budget currently is, is a frozen. And then we also um, were tighter on our position controls with replacement of, um, of positions. So as, as people turned, retired and we froze some of those positions if it didn't if it didn't impact patient care and here's a visual of what current state for fy19 looks like yeah and compared to the year end 2018 there's a lot more black in the expense areas which means uh, favorable variances um, on the expense lines the net revenues uh, year to date are off about four hundred thousand. Uh, but the, the other large line that you see in there is locums, uh, as you've also heard from us, from us Scottney, um, our, our contract labor is uh, much higher than we anticipated this year. Um, right now, we don't see that changing drastically. Uh, we have another slide that shows the breakout of where, the, where those positions are. Um, a good vast majority of those are in our RN area, but we do have some allied health. Um, that we're contracting with too, which are which are also pretty expensive. The chargeable supplies um, is unfavorable uh, as an expense variance, but we those are by definition of the expense we do charge for those. <clears throat> then we also have supplies that are uh, favorable uh, variance on our expense line. Uh, part of that is our contracting through NIA uh, to get better supply pricing. So you can see at the end there that uh, shows that $350,000 gap that we have currently in our operating margin. And again, as we look at the projection through March, we believe that uh, things are continuing to improve. Um, historically, it appears in our market, uh, the summer months are stronger than uh, the last or the start of the fiscal year. So, um, so we're on a good uh, run rate right now. Here's a visual of the, uh, the contract labor just for um, um, 
for purposes of illustrating all across the organization what we work on. So this is an inter internal document that we use to track every person that's in, um, in an agency. And on this list, this is through the beginning of March, we have 13 positions that are, um, we can <laughs> three of them, um, four, four positions are docs, six are RNs, and three are specialists. In this, um, in that one of these columns, third column from the right, represents what our anticipated end date is. Um, some of these are six-week or 12-week assignments, and so as we, as those assignments are nearing completion, we're asking ourselves, do we have the position replaced, or are we going to extend it? And so we always have eyes on this and we can look at this um, on a on a regular basis. We had um, some, you know, some of these are anticipated. Uh, um, uh, turnover of staff and others aren't. So we had, uh, for example, one ED physician that went on unexpected medical leave. And so that all of a sudden, you know, we have to fill the shift. And so that's an illustration of why we would have a ED doctor uh, locum. We're, our, we're I'm, since joining the team here, I am exploring some out of the box thinking about how we can work with other organizations, other hospitals to share staffing. Um, so if since this goes up or down, is there an opportunity to share with neighboring hospitals so that we don't have to adjust staffing, um, but we can depend on uh, some sort of flow pool, if you will. And so uh, with our proximity to St. John's Ferry, uh, Sean Tester and I are working together to, and, and our chief nursing officers are working together to explore a concept through a limited liability corporation of establishing a shared RN flow pool. And, um, and so out of that idea is generating uh, other ideas such as shared flow pool for um, obstetric personnel and um, even uh, considering it for onboarding new staff. So for example, if a RN is onboarding uh, on the OB that, um, with the low volumes in maternal child health, it's hard to train new staff and get the volumes. So uh, we're exploring an opportunity where we could share the staff between the two facilities and float them back and forth based on the volume um, of the organizations. So again, here is the, the financial forecast projection um, for um, actual, and then the, the black is our budget, but we, we see, we, we're seeing that come back in line. Um, um, we have um, a $1.8 million line that we've had to draw on in the last year for cash flow purposes, um, and that was related to our Athena transition. Um, I'm happy to report that as of last week, we paid that down to 1.2 million. So we are seeing an increase in cash flow um, despite the, the small operating loss, and uh, I think that's important to point out that uh, it's going in the right direction, and we anticipate continuing to pay that down. Um, I have asked for a physician development plan um, and working with an organization that will help us keep to, um, to, to work with our physicians and, um, and, our, and um, seek to understand what our population base can support across all specialties. So we'll have a survey with our physicians and then we're doing analytical work with a company called 3D and um, out of that we'll have a roadmap for the next three to five years of what specialties that we can support in our market um, and I've um, asked um, St. Johnsbury to also consider using that, pro using that product because it could show that we could share resources between the two hospitals for um, the, the development of physicians. Our limited liability corporation already shares um, some staffing. Um, we have a sleep lab and pulmonary program that the hospital at North Country fronts and then lends the staff to the program that's down in St. Johnsbury. So, um, that's an example of things that we're trying to work and do out, think out of the box. Also, um, keeping an eye on our campus development, we have a facility master plan um, that will soon go underway where we seek to understand what infrastructure improvements will we need to make in the next three to five years, um, and even 10, 10 plus years, because um, we have, um, we want to be mindful of the operating margin that <coughs> we need to produce so that we can fund those through our capital programs and spending our capital wise. Um, and then the last last thing um, we have also are, we're exploring federal grants for programs in uh, maternal child health that would um, fund 
uh, program for four years that could result in as much as $3 million over four years to, uh, to it's a very competitive grant. But that would be a partner with a partnership with St. John's Berry and um, also Bradford, the Brad, Bradford um, Vermont FQHC. So those are some things that, that we'll be working on as well. So with that, we, we kept our presentation um, very high level, um, but we're here to answer your questions. Um, we believe that we're on track that we would um, our, we, would, we believe that we don't need to be rebased when we turn next year. We see that we're um, coming back in line. So, thank you. Thank you. And um, well, I hate to kick anybody when they're going through an IT uh, changeover process, but can you update us on where you're really at on that? And also let us know, because as a regulatory body, we can't make good decisions if we don't have good data, and we still don't even have your audit for 18. So maybe if you could just update us on your audit and your IT transition. Yeah. So you're talking about the FY18 actual final numbers being put into into adaptive for Chloe and her team. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping to get that completed next week. Uh, so 18 will be up to date. I believe February is up, it's up through February, correct? Is in there? And we're, we're about ready to close out on um, uh, March's financials. So hopefully within a week or so, we'll have that back on track and in line. As far as our conversions go, you know, we can convert the EHR, but we also converted our accounting system at the same time. <clears throat> and since that wasn't enough, we actually just also implemented a new budget system about two weeks ago. Um, so so we're, we're jamming it all in. And at the same time, we've lost two senior accounting uh, team members. Uh, so because, because of that change. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one, no, the one, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, one, of the, one of the team members actually, she had a, uh, a, career, a prior career in IT compliance and um, she kind of went back to the bank for that um, recent of her career. Um, it's a, obviously, you don't have a, a monthly close schedule that you're tied to. Uh, when you're in that kind of environment. So she kind of went more for a, an additional opportunity. Uh, the other one may have come back because of the additional pressure. So it is what it is. That's where we are. So I'm hoping that next, in the next week or so, we can have those numbers updated. We want to get March closed, or Mar March financials closed out. And then the next priority right after that is to get Lori and her team the 18 numbers up to date. So you had said that um, in your explanation on the bad debt, you talked about the, the change to Athena, and maybe you could just expound on that a little bit because I can see where if there's a delay in collections because of the change, but well, why would why would the change add to the bad debt? Well, part of what's happened, we have seen our bad debt climbing over the last couple of years, but one of the things that um, is the last thing that we're looking at with our AR with Athena is the self-pay piece of it and. Because we switched systems, we, we actually had a, an outside vendor that helped us manage our self-pay accounts. And we're doing call collections and putting people on payment plans. The access for them into Athena, there was a delay in getting that access, so the AR has actually grown. Um, we actually have Athena on site right now to do a revenue cycle evaluation with us to do a deeper dive to make sure, you know, we're at a point now where we can actually look deeper into our revenue cycle and our AR management. And one of the big things is self-pay. It's grown to roughly 20% of our current AR. So when that happens, self-pay ages out and we're reserving those aged out amounts. So that number is growing, which has an impact on our back net. We re-engaged that outside vendor about a month ago. So we're starting to see those collections come in, but since it is self-pay, it's, it's slow to work that down. Given some of the uh, recent press about other institutions that have uh, had security breaches, do you have any concerns about the, the cloud-based product? Um, I always have concerns with security breaches because I'm also a compliance officer and IT security officer. But um, the cloud-based product tends to be more secure because there's less avenues of access as opposed to an on-site network. So the cloud base is actually a little bit more secure. As far as uh, a, a breach from the outside into Athena, 
Um, I think there's always going to be a concern of that. You see breaches all the time with everything all the way up through what should be an extremely secure government entity that gets penetrated. So there's always a, a little bit of a, in the back of my mind, concern. Do they offer you any type of guarantees? I, they did not offer us guarantees, but we do have in the contract um, dollars and cents for mitigation of breaches with them that were increased above and beyond what they normally had for contracts. Okay. And then on the, uh, I would add just um, for, uh, real quick, Kevin, that anytime there's a breach in our state or um, anywhere else in the country of a hospital, um, IT is the first place that we're asking the questions of, okay, what, what can we learn from that? Um, it's, a, it's an industry that continues to reinvent, reinvent, uh, um, invent how they, um, how they uh, infiltrate. And so, um, you know, there was, a, there was a breach, I think, within the last um, month or two in our state, and uh, we were pleased to know that we, we had some um, mechanisms already in place that you know, potentially guarded us from those, but you just seek to learn and cross your fingers that your hospital isn't the first one. To, have that happen. And my last question was on the travelers and locums. Um, what percentage uh, above the normal cost of an employee, uh, employee are you seeing your actual expenses for these travelers? I'd say it's about three times. Three times? Mm -hmm. Depending on the position. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Other questions from the board? Marie? Um, just a couple questions. Um, uh, I like the bridges that you did, and uh, I think you could also do that for the net revenue because, particularly where you're saying the bad debt was down a million seven fifty, but your total NPR was down a million seven. So, wondering whether free care was lower as well, because I kind of look at the two of those together. Um, but if we had a bridge to yeah. show that, that may show that as well. So did, did you see a change in free care? No, our free care is actually has been running really close to what our budget has been, uh, both last year and this, this year, um, fiscal year to date. So that number's been pretty <coughs> consistent. Um, the bad debt's the one that's actually spiked. Um, and then just, you know, your trend for operating margin. Um, with a loss of 1.9 and 17, 1.9 and 18, and then potentially trending negative, you know, with your new forecast. Um, you know, that's that's something that obviously we're worried about, you know, in the state. And just, you know, when you talked about whether or not you'd be rebased, um, you know, we're going to make final decisions, you know, in a couple of weeks, but. Um, you probably don't necessarily hit the threshold because what we did for NPR was we said you'd get to be up 5%, you know, from where your actuals was trending. But, you know, that said, the concern is that you are forecasting your top line, you know, tied into your expenses. And, and you guys do seem to be managing the expense control well, but your NPR is dropping, you know, greater than, than what's going on, so you end up losing money and so I just want to talk about kind of that trend because prior to that you were making money every year and I know at the total margin you are but you can't always rely on what's going to happen there. Yes, yeah, so I'll start and you can, you can yeah, chime in tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so I think um, what we're seeing is um, the growth, the inflation rate overall and op you know, operating um, expense is um, is more and more challenging. So there's certain things like management contracts um, for equipment and um, supply expense from vendors where we have little control of you know the inflations that they pass on to us. Um, I think one of the big things, and it was on the chart um, that you saw that's impacting us, is that locum, uh, those dollars. And in fact, um, you know we we we've seen that I think in the last budget cycle when we were projecting our budget for FY19, we, uh, we didn't anticipate this much local expense. Um, and so, um, so that is, that would, that's probably our deepest driver um, right now is that, that workforce shortage. Um, we, do have some, um, we, we do have some encouraging things that are developing. We have a, a cardiologist that we have at, at just this week 
um, signed on that will give us back the coverage that we had before. We had one retire within this budget cycle. Um, and then we have a ED physician that we are in um, active agreements, um, negotiating terms. So those types of things are things that will that will um, help us develop, decrease that, that local expense. Um, but the workforce shortage isn't going away. And, and you know, you've heard that probably from every, I know you've heard it from every hospital. Um, so we're, you know, by developing the LLC and looking at trying to do these things differently, that's what I look to see to elevate um, and control some of our operating expense. At the same time, um, I want the North Country to be in the uh, uh, position to invest in the health of the community, you know, stepping away from the hospital. So uh, we currently don't um, participate in Rise Vermont, and that's a program that I want us to invest dollars into uh, that's going to take an investment um, that will reap, I think, rewards in the, in the future. But there's, there's capital operating expense outlay for that. Um, we are one step in with one care, meaning uh, just Medicaid. Um, and you know, Mountain Scutney just told, told you about what their risk level is and what their risk tolerance is. So we have to we're, we're considering what what that uh, that impact could be on us as well. So Andre, I'll let you follow the other comments. Uh, that's, that's good. I think um, you know the listening to Mountain Scutney, it, it almost seemed like a mirror image of what we're going through with the volumes where. They had strong volumes in there last, last quarter, first quarter, and now it's dipped down, or it's really reverse. Um, very, very strange um, environment that we're in when we're really two and a half hours apart from each other. We have differences in our volumes. Um, that's, that's the only other comment that I have. I, I see our volumes coming back right now um, you know, from where they were in the first quarter. Thanks. Other questions from the board? Tom? Um, my first question was the same as Maureen had. I'm sitting here trying to uh, add up the pluses and minuses of the red and blue lines and organize them by uh, expenses and revenues, and uh, I never got it right after three tries. We tried to listen at the same time, so and that bridge would be very helpful. Um, I'm just I'm I'm not uh, an expert at all by any means in dish payments, but I was looking at at your uh, trend here in 2016 at 1.8 million, 2017 at 1.4 million, 2018 at 400,000, and then it looks like the projected for 2019 was up to like 880,000. Um, what drives that from, from your perspective? Um, the, the, the calculation over the years, um, there's, there are three different buckets of dish funding. It's all done through the as you know. Um, in one of the years, one of the buckets, uh, one, one of the hospitals in one of the buckets fell out because they were in that bucket alone. How that money got distributed changed when it became two buckets. Then in 2017, the, um, the, the legislature took $10 million out of our dish money, hospital-wide, and then in 18, they took another almost $5 million out. So between those two things, changes in calculations, and the reduction in actual dish dollars, you see that significant downward trend. And you still have the provider tax with, with the other, other side of that? Yeah, that's gone up. Yeah. And I, um, I was just looking at your, your uh, projected payer mix for 2019, and you had uh, Medicaid, which was your smaller revenue line, but you had that going up 13%. Does that look like it's on track? Uh, right now, it looks like the, the payer mix is pretty much on track. Um, you know, our Medicare and Medicaid combined is about 65% of our payer mix, uh, with Blue Cross being 16, and then everything else falls under that. So those are the, you know, our three major payers that make a good chunk of our revenue. The most final one, just in terms of bad debt, um, <clears throat> it, it seems, you know, you know, just a common refrain hospitals and that has gone up because of high deductibles. It's, it's, um, and so when you when you mention high deductibles, are you talking about the QHP population or or, or other forms of, 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 of private insurance? Um, QHP? Um, oh, okay. Change, change. Yeah. 
Uh, I think it's a combination of the two. We see, you know, the exchange has a high deductible, but even the private insurers, um, you know, we have some smaller, pretty significant businesses in our area that's small compared to statewide that are on a Blue Cross or Signet plan, and their deductibles are in the five thousand dollar range. So that that um, automatically falls to yourself pay after uh, insurance pays. Other questions to the board, Robin? Do you want to go next? I just have a quick one. Um, I'm just interested in the agreements that you're pursuing with St. Johnsbury um, to share services and build a float pool. And I'm just wondering if you have any estimates of the cost savings you might achieve in doing that. Or is it too early to tell? Yeah, it's, it's too early. Um, first of all, it's just to float the idea. So um, both Sean and I met. And um, once I got his interest, then uh, was connecting our CNOs. Um, and getting, you know, making sure that they're on board with exploring that idea. Um, we got that, that, that's, they both have bought in. Um, we, uh, you know, one, one hospital is just, you know, is transitioning to Porter. So, um, good that we're still going to keep that within the state. So, um, you know, Sean is still acclimating. Actually, he started later than I did, so, <laughs> um, I'm not the newbie anymore, but, um, so we're both getting our feet on the ground and floating out ideas, so it's really high level right now. But out of that is surfacing others like, okay, well maybe float pool is too aggressive, maybe there's something like the OB, um, maternal child health that we can start. And then we have to um, we have to check in with our malpractice carrier and talk about those things. So as far as uh, estimating the cost, um, we're, we're not at that level yet. Okay, thank you. Question. So I want her to ask it first, but um, I wanted to say I, I applaud your creative thinking. I think that's exactly what we need right now in this area. So uh, I appreciated hearing about some of the preliminary ideas that you, the two of you are, are working on together. Um, I also am very interested in uh, your physician development plan in terms of understanding the population uh, needs and also uh, what the population can support in terms of specialty in that area. And we are working on the health resource allocation plan, which is kind of a statewide uh, assessment of need, resources, and gaps. Um, so we'll be very interested, I think, in hearing more about that in the future. So no questions, just wanted to uh, give you a heads up for the for the summer when we'll I'll at least come back to that question. <laughs> Okay. okay, any other questions from the board? If not, comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, we wish to thank you. All right, thank you. Our fingers are crossed for the transition. <laughs> <laughs> IT is done. not an easy thing. Yeah. Is there, any, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.